Uh, hi, everyone. We will start with the second day of Frontiers in Epigenetics and Chromatin Symposium organized by Quantitative Biosciences Institute at, uh, at UCSF. Um, I hope you can all hear me well and uh, uh, that like you, you're also looking forward, like me, you're also looking forward to the amazing um, lineup of, of talks that we have for the second day the, of the symposium. And uh, we will start off with Phil Cole from Harvard Medical School. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Danisha, for this uh, uh, great organization and, and for allowing me to participate. Uh, it's really been a great meeting so far, and um, hopefully I won't uh, drop the level too much. Um, so I am trying to share my screen. Hopefully that's working. Uh, and I wanted to start out with a few disclosures. I um, have some financial entanglements with the startup company Aislinn and uh, larger pharmaceutical company AbbVie Therapeutics, which it's very much related to some of what I'll talk about today, uh, and I'm also a consultant for Scorpion. Um, so our lab's been working on histone modifications for many, many years. I won't too, too numerous to count, um, but I will um, uh, um, give you a little brief uh, um, background. Um, actually, before I do that, just a brief outline. So. Uh, I'll start off talking about sort of the long saga that led us to developing some uh, histone acetyltransferase inhibitors that we're now using in different ways as dynamic tools. Uh, then I'll switch to more recent work uh, that um, is focused on histone deacetylation and the enzymes that remove uh, acetyl uh, groups from uh, lysine residues. And finally, a little bit of small molecule inhibition work that we're doing um, to target the uh, uh, co-rest HDAC complex. Uh, and um, yeah, so hopefully there'll be a little bit uh, in it for, for, for everyone. So this is just uh, um, uh, reminding us that our chromatin is packaged in different ways. And we'll hear, we've heard a lot about that and we'll hear more about that today. Um, uh, our focus has primarily been on the modifications that occur on histone tails. Uh, in particularly uh, uh, on histone H3 uh, and more recently histone H2B. Uh, and we've been interested in acetylation and methylation as have many labs and how those modifications uh, can exert their influence on the structure and function of chromatin. And we've uh, had a heavy focus on the enzymes that uh, uh, attach and remove these modifications, so-called writers and erasers. So the histone acetyltransferases histone deacetylases and the, um, some of the lysine demethylases. Uh, and so um, with that as a background, I wanna now jump into uh, one uh, histone acetyltransferase uh, that Tatiana introduced us to yesterday. Um, uh, we kind of refer to these interchangeably as P300 and CBP, these two very closely related paralogs. Um, they have an internal catalytic domain, so-called histone acetyltransferase or KAT, lysine acetyltransferase domain, as well as a number of other uh, non-catalytic domains that are involved in protein-protein interactions, notably a bromo domain that can bind acetylysine. We heard about the ZZ domain, which uh, as you can see, I'm using the old nomenclature, which is embedded in this cysteine, histidine-rich uh, three domain that uh, can bind zinc. Uh, and this uh, domain can bind all sorts of transcription factors. And as we heard, even histone uh, H3 tail, uh, and terminus. Um, we also know that uh, uh, P300 and CBP can uh, acetylate many lysines and many proteins, uh, the, the four core histone proteins, many transcription factors and many other proteins. And part of what our motivation has been over the years is to try to understand the structure and function of these various acetylations. Um, our initial and early approach to this was to try to develop a small molecule uh, HAD inhibitor for P300 and CBP that would be selective and potent and pharmacologically active. This proved to be very challenging. Um, as a step along the way, uh, we um, were able to uh, determine a crystal structure in collaboration with Ronan Marmerstein's lab of the catalytic hat domain, 
bound to one of our bisubstrate analogs, one called lice CoA, a, a hybrid between a lysyl residue and this, this co substrate coenzyme A. And this taught us a lot about uh, how this uh, uh, compound bound uh, and a fair amount about um, the enzyme mechanism, um, less so about uh, developing pharmacologically useful probes, but uh, we did in silico screening using this structure and with lots of medicinal chemistry ultimately per, being performed at a start, startup company called Aceland and then later Abvi. Uh, it led to uh, a, a very useful chemical probe, at least we think it's useful, uh, called A485. Um, this compound uh, is an oxazolidine diome uh, spiro compound and um, it is a uh, cell active and in vivo active compound. Uh, its potency is submicromolar, uh, typically, depending on the assay. Uh, and um, uh, as we heard about yesterday, the, the kind of uh, classical acetylation sites that P3 have to regulate uh, are targeted uh, by uh, uh, adding this compound to cell culture. So these are prostate cancer cells treated with A485 in a dose dependent way showing a drop-off in acetylation of lysine 18 and lysine 27, um, very little effect on lysine 9. Um, this compound is anti-proliferative, so one always has to worry about kind of secondary effects. For this particular cell line, the anti-androgen enzalutamide is also uh, capable of slowing the growth of these cells, but it does not have these um, diagnostic effects on, on lysine acetylation. So one of the many pieces of evidence suggesting that this compound is a, is a useful probe. Uh, and, um, uh, and so we and others have gone on to use this in different experiments. Uh, one great collaboration that we developed uh, was with Tuna Chowdhury at uh, the University of Copenhagen um, and using um, so-called acetylomics mass spectrometry, uh, we're able to map many lysine acetylation sites that seem to be regulated by this compound. And in all cases, we compare the effect of the small molecule inhibitor caddy here with a genetic knockout of both P300 and CBP, a transient knockout. Uh, and uh, one can see a very tight correlations between the effects of lysine acetylation um, on various proteins and sites within these proteins in many important uh, uh, nuclear uh, complexes uh, and, and, and nuclear proteins uh, um, involved in, for example, notch signaling, wind signaling, um, steroid receptor co-activators, uh, and, and, and many others. Um, almost all of these sites were found in the nucleus, as makes sense given P300 and CBP's location. Uh, and um, again, most of them showed uh, uh, very significant effects in this sort of uh, reasonably quantitative mass spec assay. Of course, for this meeting, one would be interested in knowing what happens at histones. And uh, we did see some of the classical effects on histone H3 and some on histone H4, but we're sort of um, most uh, sort of interested and surprised to see quite dramatic effects on lysines in histone H2B, again, both with the uh, um, small molecule and genetic knockout. Um, Bromo domain inhibitor for P300 and CBP had relatively little effect uh, on acetylation. Um, again, maybe not so surprising. There were also pretty large effects on histone H2A uh, and terminal lysines. Uh, so um, H2B um, post-translational modifications in general, at least on its N-terminus, have not received a lot of attention. Uh, and so we're uh, continuing to follow up on this. I'll show you one direction in a little while, but this prompted us to think also about the kinetics of things. And so that's one um, nice feature of having a small molecule inhibitor is the ability to, um, uh, uh, to look at faster timescales than say typical genetic approaches. Uh, and what one can see is that the uh, uh, H histone H2B and histone H3 lysine acetylation sites were reasonably fast turnover, particularly lysine 11 and 12 of histone H2B uh, after small molecule treatment. Um, and in histone H3, uh, lysine 18 and lysine 27. Uh, and, uh, and so um, 
in order to see, of course, the loss of acetylation, one needs HDAC activity. Uh, and so that has become uh, a direction that our lab has been taking. I should point out that uh, if you look sort of proteome wide at the various acetylation sites, a fair number fall into this very fast turnover, but there are quite other, uh, a number of others that show um, slow turnover that could either be indirect effects or perhaps more likely just a less accessibility to HDACs. So we've been studying a number of the HDAC complexes using in vitro biochemistry. Uh, this is the kind of the first large subset that we looked at, and we've done this in close collaboration with a wonderful lab at the University of Leicester led by John Schwab. Um, we've spent a lot of time looking at the co-rest complex here. We'll call also call it LHC for LSD1 HDAC co-rest. It not only has a histone deacetylase, but has this important histone demethylase associated with it. I'll come back to that in a little while. Uh, and then um, uh, the well-known well uh, NERD complex and SYN3B, which have these classical subunits. Perhaps a less studied or less well-known HDAC complex uh, called the mitotic deacetylase complex or MIDAC, which is, has as a, a core subunit uh, MIDAS. And, and then a, uh, these are all HDAC1 complexes uh, an HDAC3 complex known as SMART or NCORE uh, that has um, uh, the SMART uh, subunit. Um, so these have all been made uh, in uh, a transient transfection assay in ATK293 cells, where we uh, use a sort of a three, typically a three plasmid system that has HDAC1, uh, a, a co repressor, and then the third subunit, um, one of which is usually tagged, and then we release with a uh, uh, like a TEV protease cleavage to, um, to remove it off an immuno uh, um, affinity column. Uh, and we can get you know, relatively pure and relatively homogeneous uh, um, HDAC complexes. A number of these have been looked at in the Schwab lab using cryo-EM and, and had um, uh, pretty good structural insights uh, from those kinds of experiments. Um, so uh, another technology that is important in our lab uh, is uh, protein semi-synthesis. And uh, in recent years, we've adopted a technique uh, that has used an enzyme to make uh, uh, histone H3, and as you'll see, histone H2B. Uh, the enzyme is derived from sortase. So sortase is a bacterial transpeptidase enzyme. And it was first evolved by a former postdoc of mine, Dirk, Dirk Schwarzer, when he was an independent investigator. Uh, he's now at the University of Tübingen. Uh, and uh, he made a form of it that he called F40 sortase, uh, which allows uh, the um, uh, residues APA uh, uh, TX to be recognized, or particularly APX TG uh, to be recognized. So standard sortase prefers a, a leucine at this position rather than an alanine. So that's what the mutant allows it to accept this alanine residue. Uh, and, and this is conveniently located in around residue 30 uh, of histone H3, which allows one then to access most of the N-terminal amino acids that one would be interested in. Uh, and um, uh, one twist to make the ligations go better is to replace the standard amide bond, since this is a transpeptidase, it will work on standard peptides, but if you replace the uh, amide with an ester linkage here, uh, then you can um, make the reaction go faster and uh, typically to higher yields. Uh, so this is how we, we make um, our semi-synthetic H3s for the most part, uh, and we've incorporated all sorts of PTMs in the N-terminus. Um, this is now using these the nucleosomes derived from the various um, site-specifically labeled uh, histone H3s, along with a series of, of different um, HDAC. Uh, this is just isolated HDAC1, as well as uh, some of the complexes I've, I've told you about. And uh, th this is probably the first heat map I think our lab, at least I've ever presented from our lab. Um, so I, I'm kind of feeling more in the genomics error. It's kind of a small heat map. So uh, there's, there's not a, a, a lot of squares here, but um, there are a few things that I wanted to remark on. So one is that um, uh, depending on the HDAC complex, and the, the first four of these all use HDAC1, we do see differences in the kinetics. And this is not observed, I'm not showing you the data, um, to anywhere near this extent with 
uh, the, the um, uh, purified um, uh, histone rather than using nucleosome substrates. So this becomes apparent with nucleosome substrates. And uh, one remarkable uh, selectivity is a rejection of lysine-14 acetylation by the LSD1 containing CoRes complex. And this is, this is notable to us because uh, uh, LSD1, which is part of this complex, demethylates lysine-4 of histone H3, but it's prevented from doing that by lysine-14 acetylation. And the fact that the CoRes complex is so unable to deacetylate the 14 position speaks to some perhaps important crosstalk between those two uh, modifications and gets at one of the things that people in our field are striving for, which is what are the sort of histone code requirements for these kinds of things. It's notable that the, the, the MIDAC complex uh, was the most active on nucleosomes. It's actually significantly less active than CoRest on free histone. So it's a it's sort of built for nucleosome deacetylation, uh, presumably in a non-transcription um, factor dependent way, unlike most of these other complexes, perhaps explaining why they're, they seem poorer at deacetylating nucleosomes. And HDAC1 itself was not able to be active. And the SMART complex is sort of in the same range as, as, as most of these HDAC1 uh, complexes. So as I mentioned, we got interested in H2B from the work um, on P300 inhibition. And it turns out that um, like histone H3, there's a motif that looks sort of like a sortase site. It doesn't have an alanine or a leucine here. So sortase likes a leucine here. The original sortase that I showed you called F40 likes a histidine here. Sorry, likes a, an alanine here. Um, uh, histone H2B has a, a histidine. Um, uh, people uh, uh, in our lab, particularly Ming Chuan Mu, Ji Peng Wang, and Sam Whedon, have been finding a new sortase, uh, one that uh, we call W23 sortase, uh, which can tolerate pretty well histidine at this position. Um, so now we're, we're ligating uh, the first um, uh, 48 or so residues of histone H2B to uh, uh, the recombinant um, C terminal part of histone H2B. Uh, and um, using, uh, uh, again, an ester linkage uh, to do this, to drive it. And, you know, these are sort of some playing around with conditions. We can't get uh, um, complete conversion, but we can get substantial uh, uh, production of histone H2B using this uh, approach. Uh, and so we've gone on to look at some of the modifications that you see here, not only acetylation sites in these positions, uh, many of which were known uh, based on prior mass spec studies, but also these more recently discovered so-called acylations of lysines, particularly beta-hydroxybutyryl and lacteal discovered by uh, Yingming Zhao's lab at the University of Chicago on the 11 position. And some more heat maps. So this is comparing the nucleosome deacetylation rates uh, to um, uh, deacetylating or deacylating the uh, free histone uh, uh, species. Um, what you can see here is uh, looking now mostly at uh, H2B. Uh, included here are uh, H2H3 sites that you saw earlier, as well as beyond acetylation, a, a lactate and a beta hydroxybutyrate at the uh, lysine 11 position. Um, the uh, uh, notable findings were that uh, the MIDAC was still the best enzyme uh, complex for uh, deacetylating most of the sites within histone H2B, although it does show significant differences in site specificity as you go towards the globular domain of histone H2B. Uh, and CoREST was pretty good. Uh, some, many of the other enzymes uh, were less good. Um, we also looked a bit at sirtuins, since um, sirtuin enzymes, which are the NAD dependent D, acetylases uh, uh, have been thought to uh, act on chromatin, certainly SIR-T2 anyway. Um, and we did see um, some ability to deacetylate uh, nucleosomes with these enzymes. As you can see, uh, the enzymes that um, uh, are much in general faster uh, at deacetylating free histone 
um, showing typically less substrate specificity, although there were some oddities uh, for particular locations. Uh, and again, MIDAC is better at deacetylating uh, nucleosomes versus free histone. See here, I'm a little stuck. Uh, there we go. So in the last few minutes, I wanted to tell you about work that we're doing in the small molecule arena to um, target two enzymes with one molecule, uh, HDAC1 and LSD1, which are, as I talked about before, are members of this co-rest complex. Uh, and um, the idea was really driven by the fact that um, work that we have done with LSD1 inhibitors had relatively modest uh, um, effects in some of the kind of cancer models that we were looking at. Uh, and so we wanted to sort of see if we could um, create a new kind of compound that would bring together an LSD1 inhibitor of which there are many great scaffolds, this cyclopropylamine being probably the most famous type, um, along with uh, class one uh, type HDAC inhibitors that are characterized by having this benzamid functionality. Uh, and we made a series of different compounds. This is the compound that we're most interested in right now that includes, again, the warhead of the LSD1 inhibitor and the HTAC inhibitor bridged by this phenyl ring. And one of the things that we can do with these purified complexes is do sort of careful enzymological analysis. And that led to the interesting discovery that the, um, the dual inhibitor corin, as we call it, um, has the longest, it's, it was not really more potent in short-term assays than individual compounds as, as a deacetylase inhibitor, but it was comparable. But for um, sort of uh, so-called jump dilution assays, which allow you to kind of get a sense of resonance time, um, Corin um, sort of still stuck to the enzyme complex uh, co-rest, but not other complexes. Uh, whereas the other uh, in, uh, inhibitors, uh, either as combinations, the LSD1 and MS275 in combination, uh, or uh, as um, uh, 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 analogs of them, which lack, for example, the cyclopropylamine um, functionality, don't, don't have that effect. Now, you might ask uh, whether the inhibition is sort of dual, you know, simultaneous with the two enzymes. We don't think so initially, but perhaps um, one reaches a confirmation that can achieve that. Um, the um, a compound has been looked at in many diff different types of cancer cell lines and melanoma. Seems like a particularly attractive cell line to look at. We've collaborated with Rhoda Alani's group on this. Uh, and um, what you can see here is that uh, uh, the dual inhibitor corin in blue typically shows the greatest um, antiproliferative effect versus the other comp compounds uh, at this uh, one micromolar dosage. Uh, and you can achieve that simply by adding one micromolar of the kind of the two components of corin uh, compound seven and MS275. Um, sorry. Uh, I have a big red blotch on my screen. I don't know if it disappeared. Uh, so I'm, um, so looking at gene, uh, expression changes induced by the inhibitor, uh, we see that, um, uh, the corn compound shows in general, a larger number of genes affected, um, both globally and in the tumor suppressor category in melanoma. Uh, and, um, um, but there was substantial overlap as you would guess with the HDAC inhibitor that it was derived from MS275. Um, here are examples of a gene like uh, CHOP, which is highly induced by corin uh, compared to the uh, single acting MS275. Uh, and um, SIN, an example of a, of a gene that's induced by both fairly evenly. In general, when we look at um, uh, chromatin, using chromatin amino precipitation assays, uh, we see more LSD1 uh, associated with the chromatin for genes that are, are duly affected, as you might expect. This compound is, is useful pharmacologically, so it can work in vivo. And this is a, um, one example of a melanoma xenograft that has been looked at with this compound. Uh, and it does target um, acetylation and methylation uh, in the tumor cells uh, and um, um, it also shows the comparable types of gene expression changes. 
and effects on Ki67. Um, in some unpublished or, or preprint data, I should call it, uh, we've found that uh, Corin can resensitize melanoma that's resistant to the BRAF inhibitor, uh, vemurafenib, um, that uh, Corin allows uh, vemurafenib now to, to be um, a potent uh, at uh, inhibiting uh, these cells, uh, as demonstrated, for example, by uh, data here. Uh, so overall, uh, we um, are excited to explore the, the full scope of this compound. And this just allows me to summarize what I've told you, uh, that uh, we are working with P300 CBP hat inhibitors for proteomic studies. We're looking at um, the kinetics of this, uh, and we are, are interested in how HDACs achieve their specificities and the role of the functions of these uh, with nucleosomal substrates. And of course, uh, I just talked about Corin. So it remains for me to thank uh, the fabulous people that I've been fortunate to work with on this project, both people in our lab. Um, uh, so the most uh, significant contributions I talked about today came from Jay Colleen, uh, a prior postdoc now at uh, Janssen, uh, Ming Xuan Wu, a um, prior postdoc now uh, on the faculty at Westlake University, uh, and three current postdocs, Xi Ping Wang, Sam Whedon, and John Lee. And I th think I've mentioned most of our collaborators here. So um, uh, I forgot to say Andrea Matevi at the University of Pavia has been great as well, and his, his uh, former um, colleague, Andrea Gomez. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions if there are any. Uh Thank you, Phil, for, for the excellent talk. Um, panelists, please put your questions into the Q&A box and I'll read them from there. Sorry, the uh, attendees and panelists, please uh, uh, raise your hand with any questions. Maybe I can get us started. Um, beautiful. First of all, thank you for all the sorties that you and your former lab members, we are very grateful to Dirk and you uh, for uh, uh, sharing this with the community. They have been very helpful to us. Um, wonderful to see the panel of uh, nucleosomes that you've been able to make with um, available um, sorties. Is I was wondering what your thoughts are based on the um, uh, complex architecture and the means present on, on MIDEC's unusual ability to modify nucleosomes better than histones. Houston, Houston yeah, so that so that's a that's a, a really interesting question. Thanks. So, um, so the short answer is we don't know for sure, um, but the um, uh, speculation is that, first of all, MIDAC can bind nucleosomes better uh, than these other complexes uh, and is not reliant on a transcription factor. So part of it may simply be affinity. Um, there may well be um, sort of an e evolutionary design if it's important as a kind of general deacetylase, for example, in replication, uh, that it uh, needs to do that. Um, why it's less good at histones, I, I suspect it's DNA interaction. So I think that there are uh, key elements uh, of the MIDEC complex that interact with DNA. So that's kind of the short answer is, but there's a lot more to do. Thank you. Um, I'll just then go with one very quick question. Uh, is there a synergy in between enzalutamide and uh, uh, A485 molecule? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think in general, there, there is not. Um, even in uh, androgen-dependent um, uh, uh, prostate cancer, uh, and not sure why that's the case. Um, one really nice thing, of course, about P300 inhibition, one direction that people in the urology field are interested in is androgen-resistant, um, androgen inhibitor-resistant prostate cancer, which P300 inhibitors do work well on, as you, as you might predict. Um, and, um, and so that, that's, that's one potential uh, direction for clinical application. Thank you, Phil, again for, for the excellent talk. Our next speaker is Yael David, who is uh, joining us for this symposium from Memorial uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Uh, welcome, Yael, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Danica and, and Gita, for, for inviting me to speak today. And also, not so thank you for putting me after Phil Cole, who's one of my idols and, of course, a very tough act to follow. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to, to do my best. Um, 
So yeah, not surprisingly, my lab is interested in understanding fundamental mechanisms uh, related to epigenetic regulation of transcription and how the misregulation of these events can lead to disease states and being at Sloan Kettering, particularly cancer. Uh, but we leverage chemistry and chemical biology in order to understand these really intricate mechanisms that link specific changes on chromatin and particularly his homodifications and transcriptional output. And the way I like to think that we sort of leverage chemical biologies in two main ways. One is by developing and applying very powerful chemical tools that allow us to investigate new biology. And sometimes I dare to say a new bio, uh, old biology with a new lens, um, but also studying specific chemical reactions that occur in cells and actually alter the cell's epigenetic state and, and ultimately fate. And we sort of thread that line in, in this interdisciplinary space uh, where we uh, do chemistry and biology. And again, uh, I dare to say that we've been expanding it to, on one hand, more biophysics, um, uh, and on, on the other hand, even more um, animal uh, research and patient samples. Uh, we definitely love the application as well as the discovery, the basic and translational. And recently, the academia and industry, we have several industry collaborations that we're very, very excited about. So, um, of course, our, uh, our playground, uh, our scientific playground is chromatin. Um, and today I'll tell you specifically about one of the major interests in my lab, which is the non-enzymatic modifications of histones as, as a new link between metabolism and cell fate. But I do want to mention that we also work a lot on characterizing uh, linker histone H1, um, as well as non-canonical histone ubiquitination. Um, epigenetic regulation of, of viruses and Hep B as, a, as, a, as an example, um, and epigenetics and immunology. And there's an overarching um, sort of uh, goal in each of these cases to, to uh, utilize chemical probes and protein engineering. And I do want to give a shout out to two of my people at postdoc, a fantastic postdoc and a fantastic student that, will, that are giving flash talks in, in these, uh, this meeting. One is about H1 and one is about Hep B, so uh, you should definitely tune in. Okay, so I don't need to remind this crowd that epigenetic is sort of the dynamic transition between an active or an open uh, form of chromatin and, and the closed form of chromatin. And there are various layers of regulation, transcription factors, um, DNA modification, RNA modifications, uh, but we're particularly interested in histone modifications. Um, and also, what happens in diseases such as cancer, where regions that are supposed to be suppressed, uh, such as oncogenes, are now being sort of decorated with active marks and are being expressed, and vice versa, when tumor suppressors that, that are supposed to protect the cell from, from becoming cancerous are now being repressed. Um, but as, as chemical biologists and sort of the, the, one of the driving questions in my lab uh, was the fact that these Chromatin does not exist on a white page or in PBS is sometimes uh, biochemists like to think about it, but it's actually in a very chemically dense environment that includes cofactors, metabolites, and et cetera. And in diseases such as cancer where metabolism completely shifts and generates a whole new plethora of, 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 of small molecules that can react uh, with chromatin chemically, we were wondering if these reactions can directly affect chromatin structure and function. And I would say the, the main sort of driver of this question was, okay, here we go, sorry, uh, is the known sort of epidemiological link between changes in the environment and the metabolic state of the, the organism and the cellular microenvironment and diseases uh, such as cancer. And what we were hypothesizing is that there are these chemical reactions that can damage chromatin or even affect it in a, in a very specific manner that can lead to histone damage or chromatin damage. And that can contribute to diseases, disease progression. And beyond understanding these fundamental sort of mechanism, we're also interested in identifying new vulnerabilities that we could potentially target. And um, so I would say I would phrase this overall question that, that sort of I started my lab with was, could chromatin damage, non-enzymatic damage serve as a metabolic link between environment and cancer? 
And um, when I started, there weren't as many, but now uh, Sarah, who will be uh, speaking at the Flash Talks today, uh, wrote a, a beautiful um, review outlining some of the new chemical reactions that were identified on, on histones. And, and I have to say, they're, they're increasing by, by the month, and I'm very excited to, to be part of it. And today I'll tell you, um, I'm sorry, that many of them, of course, are poorly characterized, but what today I want to tell you is our interest in, in glycation. And when we started this, uh, this, this venture, I would say, uh, we hypothesized that non-enzymatic modifications could potentially disrupt chromatin in several layers. Um, the first one was just to change it by changing uh, the, um, uh, the epigenetic state of, of or the 3D structure of chromatin by simply changing the, the charges on the histones or on the DNA. Uh, the other one is by changing the interaction uh, between, um, between different proteins and the DNA, recruitment of effector proteins, and eventually something that I'll, I'll, I'll touch a bit on is by forming these cross-things between histone, histone, histone DNA um, that can change the dynamics nature, nature of chromatin. So <clears throat> I just want to remind you that glycation is very chemical common chemical process um, that we uh, eat, some of us daily, in our creme brulee, uh, in our, uh, you know, browning of our steak. And um, it's even part of the reasons why, why we have wrinkles. It's the non-enzymatic modifications of our uh, collagen that causes uh, these cross-linking that can uh, decrease their dynamics. And it's even used in diagnostic as glycation of your hemoglobin is how uh, we measure the, uh, the degree of diabetes, the degree, uh, the, the relative uh, uh, levels of sugars in your blood. And um, I was particularly interested in glycation. I know going from creme brulee to histones is a really sort of hard transition, uh, but it makes sense when you think about it as histones are really potentially prime targets for these um, reactions with sugar because they have very, very long half-lives. In fact, in, in neurons, for example, the half-life of histones can reach uh, months and even years. Um, they have highly accessible uh, reactive tail that, that have um, many nucleophilic side chains, lysines and arginines, um, and they're very, very abundant. And of course, changes to chromatin, as we heard from Phil and, and we know, um, you know uh, in the field for many years, can change the chromatin architecture and thus affecting cellular transcription and fate. And so just to uh, one sort of uh, more chemical uh, uh, slide, just to remind you the chemical reaction that glycation is, um, here the, depicting lysines and arginines on, on proteins that can react with the um, open chain form of sugars such as glucose to form this shift phase because uh, glucose as well as um, many other sugars exist in this equilibrium between the open and the closed state. And the open state can react to form this shift phase that can rearrange to a more stable uh, a Medorin product. And what we're sort of more, more interested um, in being at the cancer center is molecules such as methylglyoxal that are byproducts of, of anaerobic glycolysis of glucose, but are highly reactive dicarbonyls that react both with lysines and arginines to form a sort of um, also sort of an intermediate that can quickly uh, dehydrate to form these more stable um, adducts. And both of these uh, forms, and as well as many other forms, uh, can rearrange further into what we call advanced glycation end products. And they're called end products because to this day, to, uh, there is no known reversal mechanism. So they're really um, sort of terminal states of, of adducts. And one of these um, AGEs is, is cross-linking. And why this was really interesting for us is because in epigenetics, as we said from, from, from the first slide, it's the dynamic transition of chromatin that gives it its regulatory um, uh, foundation. And if you start cross-linking and reducing its dynamics, then you can disrupt its regulatory, um, um, the, the regulatory mechanisms. And um, of course, these are very detrimental um, um, reactions. Um, and cells evolve many mechanisms to um, avoid them. Some of them are upstream of the formation of these reactive species, such as GLO1, GLO2. Um, but another one is DJ1, and I will be spending some time talking about DJ1, which is why I'm mentioning it. It's a it's a deglycase, and and I'll I'll talk a little bit more about it, um, how we we sort of investigated it later on. 
And another mechanism uh, that is not uh, D-glycase per se, because it's a, it is a kinase that actually phosphorylates the three prime hydroxyl, uh, uh, the, the, the three prime position um, of the adduct and sort of shifts the equilibrium, but FN3K is a really interesting uh, protein. Now, as I mentioned, I'll talk uh, more about MGO and DG1, but we do have work on FN3K that we published in JAX uh, just last year. If you're interested in more uh, hearing about ribose glycation in FN3K, uh, you're welcome to, to, um, to search that uh, really cool paper. Okay. So um, I'll describe this work that was really spearheaded by an amazing postdoc in my lab, Ching-Fei Zhang, who just started his lab at Ohio State. So if you're looking for a position, he's doing really innovative work linking metabolism, cancer, um, and microbiology. Uh, we called him Grumpy Cat for obvious reasons in the lab. Uh, but one of the, um, I would say, only pure data slides that I'll be showing today is a very important experiment that uh, Ching-Fei did, which is where he took these um, uh, cultured cells, he added methylglyoxal to these cells, and then he chased them with MGO-free media, fractionated and analyzed it. And this is a Western blot of the results showing the soluble fraction with anti-MGO, which is a pan-MGO antibody, and the histone fraction. And what he found was that in the soluble fraction, histone or protein, sorry, proteins can undergo glycation, but their turnover within 12 to 24 hours, presumably through uh, basically protein turnover. Um, and if you look at the histone fraction, we say that histones remember. So even though um, and, you know, we chase off the MGO, even though there's cell division, there's still uh, MGO adducts on histones. And more importantly, this was sort of an experiment where we had an exogenous MGO. If you look at um, a condition where MGO is sort of endogenously uh, generated, such as in breast cancer, and we were very lucky to have access to these breast cancer patient samples, five different patients, non-tumor and tumor from each of them, showing really substantial accumulation of histone glycation in these patient samples. And indeed, when we went to also look at uh, breast cancer cell line as model system, we, uh, we gave up on humans as, as, a, as a model system. Um, we could see that this are, these are four different breast cancer cell lines compared to 293s. And what we found was really, really interesting is that these breast cancer cell lines are all very sensitive to methylglyoxal and they accumulate these histone MGO adducts much quicker. And more importantly, they have what we call basal glycation. So even in the absence of exogenous methylglyoxal, they already accumulate these glycations events. And um, being sort of a little more confident that this, these modifications occur sort of in an endogenous system, albeit um, a disease state, but still an, an important um, um, uh, setup, um, we turn to uh, do a variety of biochemical, biophysical, and, and even on a cell biology level, trying to understand precisely how these adducts occur. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go through uh, all the beautiful data that, that Ching Fei generated, but I can tell you that our final sort of model for these adducts is that um, methylglyoxal can be added when uh, the exposure is either short or at low concentration in a uh, fashion similar to acetylation by blocking, uh, reacting with lysines and arginine, blocking the positive charge on these uh, side chains and causing fiber relaxation uh, just by competing with electrostatic interactions with the DNA. But on a longer term, either a long-term exposure or high concentration, we actually start seeing these AGEs um, adducts that form crosslink, not just between histones and histones, but also histone and DNA. And these hugely disrupt the, the transcriptional program in the cell. Another mechanism where we found uh, the, the, the non-enzymatic modification, the non-enzymatic glycation to affect the epigenetic state of the cell is by competing with um, native enzymatic modifications. So um, what we did here is we treated uh, these 293s with increasing amount of methylglyoxal. We see an accumulation of these um, non-enzymatic glycations. And indeed, we see a decrease in several uh, different um, enzymatic modifications, including K4 methylation, R8 methylation and acetylation. Uh, this arginine methylation will come uh, a little more into play in, in a few minutes, uh, but arginine is actually more reactive with methylglyoxal than lysines. And this is one of the reasons why we started looking at, at arginine. But um, 
we found that that these modifications are down regulated in response to MGO, but we wanted to explore a little more if there's a, a real direct competition with glycation. And for that, we took acetylation as a, as a case study uh, because they are really fantastic, as, as Phil mentioned, HAT inhibitors, which is, are histone acetyltransferase inhibitors, and HDAC inhibitors, which, which are histone deacetylase inhibitors. And what we found is that when we uh, treat cells with HAT inhibitors, we reduce the, the overall level of acetylation uh, for obvious reasons. And these cells are much more sensitive to glycation. And in fact, just like cancer cells, they start accumulating these, these basal glycation. And when we pretreat these cells with HDAC inhibitors, we stabilize the acetylation, and these cells are much less susceptible to glycation, which means they are in some ways a bit protected. Now I can talk a lot about what I think about acetylation and its function in protecting uh, nucleophilic side chains on, on chromatin, but at least from this set of experiment, we felt a little more confident saying that there could be a more direct competition between, for example, acetylation and glycation. And now we wanted to really understand where these, these glycation events occur. And uh, because the anti-MGO antibody was not what we call chip grade, um, we could not uh, do really, uh, uh, I would say, uh, reproducible IPs with it. Um, being chemical biologists, it was very easy for us to um, go the chemical route and, and Ching Fei together with uh, Igor Maximovich uh, from my lab was a fantastic graduate student to develop this ALK MGO probe, uh, which they compare here with, with just MGO uh, and a Western blot and ALK MGO when you click on a fluorophore. And I think you can appreciate, you get a very similar, um, I would say pattern of glycation with the, with the MGO and the ALK MGO. And um, there, there's a lot more data showing their similarity in reactivity. And, and it's now a very, a very useful, um, um, I would say, probe in, in our lab to try to uh, characterize these glycation events even further. Okay, so hopefully I convinced you that MGO glycation can happen. And I sort of mentioned that cells uh, don't like this damage. And, and the question is, how do they deal with it? And uh, right when I was starting my lab, this beautiful science paper came about that showed that um, guanine, the DNA can undergo glycation. And this sort of interplayed into the cross-linking between DNA and histones uh, that I didn't get much into. But what was important is that it, uh, this, this guanine got deglycated by DJ1. Um, and this was more focused on the bacterial homologs, but they definitely did a really nice work showing this deglycation. And of course, if DJ1 deglycates DNA um, in, in vitro and is found in the nucleus, uh, we were hoping that it will also deglycate histones. And um, in order to test this, of course, we did both in vitro and in cell assays, showing really, really uh, very robustly that DJ1 both prevents the accumulation. So when you co-incubate it with, with histone H3, for example, um, you can prevent the accumulation um, of glycation on H3, uh, but you can also um, uh, completely reverse it um, uh, if you add it after uh, glycation. But the calically dead DJ1 cis106A mutant um, cannot. And similarly in cells, we found the same um, pattern where uh, when we add MGO, we get accumulation of these glycation that of course affect other uh, histone modifications. If we uh, transfect them with wild type DG1, we get uh, uh, almost a complete rescue, but not with a catalytically dead one. Now, all the cells in our body contain uh, DJ1, so even 293s that are, some would argue, not real cells, but they do contain DJ1. And if you knock down DJ1 in these cells, you actually get uh, this basal accumulation of glycation, similar to the to the breast cancer cells. And from that, we concluded that DJ1 is indeed a, a histone uh, deglycase. Um, and sort of going more deeply into the crosstalk with other histone modifications, we actually uh, decided to dive a bit deeper into citrullination because as I mentioned before, um, arginine is more reactive than lysines uh, with MGO when we figured, okay, if we um, have citrulline, which is much less reactive, it will probably, it's probably protecting um, the histones from undergoing uh, glycation. And long story short, of course it does, this citrullination, which uh, Phil again knows a lot about, is facilitated by PAD4 enzyme. And um, 
what we found is not only that uh, citronation protects histones from undergoing glycation, when we did the reciprocal experiment where we first incubated um, nucleosomes with MGO and then treated them with TG DJ1 or PAD4, we had a really interesting finding. Uh, so this is uh, either a short or a long incubation of nucleosomes with MGO and you see the adducts. If you either co-incubate DJ1 with the sugar or after a short or long incubation, you can see it rescues most part, but not when it starts forming these AGEs, these, these uh, uh, long irreversible adducts. But when we add PAD4, PAD4 was able to deal a lot better with these, um, with these um, more rearranged adducts. And of course, the combination of these um, was, was very uh, um, efficient in removing um, glycation adducts. Um, we also showed these in cells in a pulse chase experiment where we first treated cells with MGO and then PET4 to show it is able to reverse uh, the some of the glycation damage and again, forming these citrullinations um, instead. And we call this a, a rewriting activity. We definitely did a lot of work um, trying to um, um, really show the mechanism of this rewriting where we were using um, deuterated water to show that it's, it is indeed happening at sort of one, uh, at a one go. Um, and, and we think it's a really, really um, interesting sort of um, epigenetic uh, mechanism of rewriting. So I uh, just want to take the last couple of minutes to talk about cancer. I know DJ1 is overexpressed in multiple cancers. It is the hallmark of breast cancer. And um, even though it is overexpressed in cancer and used for diagnostic, it's not really known how it potentially plays a part in, um, in breast cancer driving um, or, or promoting. And we hypothesize that these breast cancer cell lines or these breast cancer tumors that are uh, highly metabolically reactive um, could be addicted to DJ1 to sort of uh, be the garbage man to take care of these uh, accumulated adducts and prevent cells from undergoing apoptosis. And using a very simple experiment, we overexpress DJ1 in 293s and showing that these cells can overcome uh, this metabolic damage much better. And if you knock down DJ1 in, in 293s, they do much worse and similar with, with PAD4. And just showing you in the breast cancer cell lines that overexpress DJ1, also our tumors overexpress DJ1. And even uh, more exciting and new, they also overexpress PAD4 and have high levels of citrullination. Um, I'm going to skip this, and I'm just going to mention that uh, Igor Maximovich, again, a, a highly productive and incredible uh, PhD student in my lab, also wanted to pharmacologically target DJ1 after we formed these, uh, we formed these genetic knockdowns, and he developed a really nice assay uh, for a high throughput screen, which he used to evaluate some new compounds that we um, identified together with uh, with the Therapeutic Discovery Institute in, in Sloan Kettering or the Tri Eye, um, also worked now with InterX company to do a more dynamic uh, like a dynamic simulations to identify new um, inhibitors but basically we're now working on on targeting DJ1 as, as uh, a way to investigate its function and if we're very very lucky also for therapeutic um, so just summarizing sort of our um, general sort of um, hypothesis regarding these, these um, uh, crosstalks and this um, um, intersection. Um, chromatin can undergo glycation by MGO and other sugars that can be re reversed by DG1, can also rearrange or uh, form these advanced glycation end product that might not be reversible. Um, it crosstalks with um, other um, and enzymatic modifications, for example, in this case, I'm showing arginine methylation, only because PET4 that also crosstalks with arginine methylation is a, is a citrullinase um, that um, also both protects uh, chromatin from undergoing glycation and also rewrites it. And citrullination is very interesting because it is itself also an end product because there is no known decitrullinase or a reimmunase. And this intersection of sugar um, methionine metabolism and calcium dependent enzymes is, is very, very interesting. 
And to put this in a more, I would say, uh, bird's eye view context, I would say that if you're a graduate student feeding on a, you know, a normal uh, diet of uh, hamburgers and tacos, um, and you also have your gut microbiome processing uh, these, uh, these foods and maybe an, an underlying uh, conditions or metabolic um, disorders such as diabetes or obesity, this all sort of forms this metabolic state of your um, cellular microenvironment that can change or affect histones non-enzymatically um, and thus affecting regulation of gene expression that together with, again, all the, the direct drivers um, can converge into, I would say, affecting um, diseases such as cancer and neurodegeneration, as well as um, cellular and, and organism aging. And with that, I will, I will end and thank my uh, incredible group of people. Um, I will uh, have, uh, have to um, thank many collaborators across uh, the Tri-I as well as uh, the world. It's, I have too many to mention, but this is just sampling a few. Um, very fortunate to be funded by uh, federal and private uh, mechanisms. And if you wanna learn more about my lab, come to the Flash Docs, as well as you're welcome to, to follow us or, or search us on the web. And I will end and take questions. Uh, thank you, Yael, for, for the excellent talk. We have one question in Q&A. It's coming from Thea Tulsti. A uh, beautiful talk. Can you detect which gene loss I might be most uh, uh, affected by glycation? So I didn't have time to show um, our RNA-seq. Uh, the problem with the RNA-seq following MGO treatment is that we can directly say that this is due to uh, uh, the, the adducts or the cellular response sort of to the treatment. Um, but we are now working with the AlkMGO doing these click chip seq, uh, trying to identify exactly which loci are mostly decorated. And then we will corroborate or, or align this with our RNA see hopefully we'll see some um you know commonalities um another question from uh, anirban dasgupta thank you for the very intriguing talk do you think the differential branching of like gly glycation chains and histone tails may dictate their fate from the signaling point of view i may have missed it but did you look into the residues and histone tails that can possibly get, get glycated uh, you didn't miss it. I didn't talk about it. Uh, it's very, very interesting and very important. Again, another um, another thing we do with our AlchemGO. We also collaborate with a, a great scientist, Jim Galligan, who is um, taking a more I would say metabolomics, max spectrometer approach, and he actually identified um, that histones undergo MGO glycation. Um, and he found that similar sites to what we found in our sort of low throughput um, Western blot um, um, assays. Similarly to us, he found that arginine 8 is a site and arginine 17 on H3, both very important sites. And in fact, we have generated, uh, Sarah ge generated um, peptide glycated peptides to um, uh, form antibodies with CST. We are supposed to get the first bleeds uh, soon. So hopefully with a site-specific antibody, we'll be able to not just um, you know, characterize it a little better, maybe even chip seek it and, and identify exactly where. So this ties to the first question, where on chromatin with genes, uh, these precise modifications occur. We do think there are many more because these adducts rearrange and they're very diverse. So it's kind of um, hard to always um, uh, catch them. Once they cross-link, it's very hard to identify. So we do think there are more sites that are, that are modified. They found, uh, similar to us, that H3 and H4 are mostly decorated. H2A almost doesn't get decorated at all, and H1 doesn't get decorated. So that's sort of interesting. Um, we, we don't have a, a chemical explanation, but maybe with time, we'll have a biological explanation to this. Thank you again, Yael, for, for an excellent talk. Thank and you. we'll be moving on to our next speaker, um, Akane Kawamura, who is joining us from uh, Newcastle University in UK. Akane. Hi. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Okay, great. 
So hello everyone and good morning to those of you in the US time zones. Um, I'm very excited to be part of this fantastic epigenetics symposium and I'm absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to share research with you. I uh, would like to thank the organizers Danica and Greta, um, Gita for their kind invitation. So um, my group's research lies at the interface of chemistry, biology and medicine and the major focus of the group is on mechanistic and functional studies of epigenetic proteins and developing chemical probes and tools for epigenetics research. So I've recently moved from Oxford to Newcastle University and the current group is currently split between the two sites with research happening at um, two locations, so south of England in Oxford and north of England in Newcastle. Uh, much of the talk that I'll be um, discussing today is uh, based on the work carried out in Oxford on histone dimethylase family of enzymes. So uh, for this audience, there's no need for introduction on epigenetics. Um, which is great, but I just wanted to highlight the diversity of different readers, writers and erasers that are involved in epigenetic regulation. We all know that it's complex with interplay of different domains and functions and substrates, um, binding partners being very context dependent. And it's very clear that comprehensive understanding of these epigenetic protein families and their substrates and their functions are needed in order to help with chemical probe and drug discovery initiatives. And in my group, uh, we've been taking a family-based approach focusing on histone demethylases, so KDMs in the first instance. So methyl, these are methyl lysine erasers, but over the years, um, it's become apparent that there is significant interplay with different proteins and domains, so readers, writers, and erasers for specific lysine methylations. And also, of course, um, cross-talk with acetylation and other post-translational modifications and the balance and the interplay that this has. So we've expanded over the years uh, beyond uh, KDMs, but today we'll focus on two aspects of the KDM research that we've done, so functional studies and the inhibitor discovery to date. So the James JC histone demethylases, um, so the um, KDNs, MJC KDNs are a major class of enzymes that are involved in the removal of tri, di, and mono N methyl groups uh, on lysines on histones. And there are over 20 enzymes in this family, all sharing the same catalytic mechanism, whereby the T oxyglutarate uh, cofactor um, and the substrate and oxygen bind the enzyme sequentially in the active site containing the catalytic ion. So the loss of CO2 from TOG generates a succinate bound reactive iron force um, oxo species that then radically um, abstracts a hydrogen from the N-methyl group, resulting in the unstable hemiaminal, uh, which can fragment to give demethylated lysines and formaldehyde. So the active site of JNJC KDMs are highly conserved, um, although the histone substrate preferences differ from methylation states and sites across different subfamilies of KDMs. Unlike many epigenetic proteins, they're involved in regulating cellular processes, such as chromatin, uh, structure and transcription, have fundamental importance in many developmental control and sulfate decisions, and many diseases, of course, in, um, uh, as most known in cancer. So these are the first generation of KDM inhibitors that have been uh, inspired by their cofactor 2OG mimics. Uh, many of these are highly collaborative, um, um, generated through uh, high, um, highly collaborative um, project efforts, and um, a lot of them bind um, the, uh, the active site ion in a bidentate manner, um, as uh, highlighted in red. And they also contain a carboxylic acid, or, uh, or a bioisosteric replacement of the mimic COG, binding that binds um, to the uh, conserved lysine at the active site. This is highlighted in blue. And this has been an effective strategy for achieving the desired selectivity across the KDM family and why the TOG oxygenases have been historically challenged. Um, but there have been some very promising selective and cell active uh, compounds reported over the last few years uh, for some subfamily members in, uh, and um, these are noted here. So while I mentioned that the KDNs are lysine demethylases, 
in trying to define the in vitro biochemistry of JNJC KDNs, we found that the substrate scope of JNJC KDNs go beyond the methyl lysine demethylation. We've shown that the methylated arginines uh, peptides are in fact substrates for five out of the seven JNJC KDNs tested um, using mass spec assays and um, also validated by NMR. And we've also subsequently shown that, as expected, the small molecule KDN inhibitors, um, mostly the ones that we've shown in the earlier slide, not only inhibit the KDN in, um, activity, but also the arginine demethylase activity with similar potency, reflecting the wider potential biological implications of KDN inhibitors through active site ion chelation modality. So it's something to uh, bear in mind. And we have since completed and extended a comprehensive biochemical screening for the remaining KDN panels for arginine demethylase activity by mass spec. And it seems clear that subfamily specific functions and activities are emerging, including, for example, all KDN5 subfamilies uh, we found to be able to uh, relatively efficiently uh, demethylate di and monomethyl arginines on histone um, substrate peptides. And this expands the scope of KDMs and highlights the importance of defining the KDM activity when targeting them. Uh, we've also um, uh, collaborated with Matthias Trotskoop at Newcastle University to uh, establish an ultra high throughput mass spec based assay using RapiFlex, mildly tough, tough um, instrument, which can rapidly run. 1,536 sample analysis and uh, high throughput combinatorial PTM analysis um, rap very rapidly. And we've carried out histone library screens with combinatorial PTMs across different enzymes systematically. And interesting combinatorial PTM effects are starting to emerge on substrate turnover and specificity. And of course, our findings need to be validated at protein levels and in cells. And this work is ongoing, including for the arginine demethylase activity. Um, we've also been scoping out the active site environment using histone peptides um, and uh, the derivatives. Um, and in an unpublished work by uh, Roman Bell, postdoc in my group, uh, he synthesized a wide range of lysine modifications on histone peptides sequences and found that bifuridine, a lysine analog, can indeed be hydroxylated by JMJC domains of the KDF5 subfamily, the histone 3K4 um, uh, demethylases in an enzyme dependent manner. So as you can see here in mass spec, you see a plus 16 on the piperidine um, is, uh, at the K4 position and MSMS identifies it to be um, specific to that site. The turnover is enzyme concentration dependent and the kinetic efficiency is also slightly, whilst it's slightly less than, demethyl, um, than uh, demethylation activity of the K4, um, the uh, activity is compatible, uh, comparable um, for the KDN5C and K, um, KDN5D. Um, but um, the KDN5As and Bs have uh, less efficient hydroxylation activity. So um, this is very um, in line with uh, previous work by Richard Hopkinson and Chris Schofield group, who show that KDMs can act on N-alkyl groups other than the methyl groups and to catalyze hydroxylation of groups. Um, and this is, a, uh, and we're currently working out the site of this oxidation um, but it's clear that our results have implications beyond histone peptide tools. So, for example, many epigenetic inhibitors have pyridines and pyrrolidines as lysine mimics. So we asked the question whether these small molecules can also be substrates of KDNs. And surprisingly, some of these are indeed modified by the enzyme uh, in a uh, catalytic um, uh, uh, way. Um, so uh, this is an example of UNC646, which is an EZH2 inhibitor, and we see uh, um, an oxidation, enzyme-dependent oxidation, plus 16, uh, occurring, and this is also time-dependent as well. Of course, this has um, 
Maybe these modifications can also have effects on EZH activity um, in a cellular context and dynamic uh, um, um, balance of those uh, the methyl transferases and demethylases. Uh, although the time level rates are likely negligible at this case, but it it emphasizes the importance of understanding various different epigenetic enzymes that are. Um, we think we know the, uh, the activities of, but uh, can be um, wider than what we'd expect. Okay, um, so, so it's becoming clear that um, many likely roles of KD, um, there are many likely roles of KDMs before, beyond the canonical histone and lysine demethylases. So it's important to develop tools, chemical tools of um, KDM, um, to probe the specific biology of these. And in collaboration with medicinal chemists, we have worked um, for a number of years on developing different approaches of inhibition, inhibiting the KDMs. So for example, with Antaleo Mai and colleagues, um, we've worked towards a pan-KDM inhibitor approach for anti-cancer reagents, um, generating dual functionality KDM, so LSD1 in inhibitor linked to Jane JC KDM inhibitor. With Paul Brennan and Martin Smith, we would worked on allosteric inhibitors of KDM2, starting from a targeted uh, library of known binders to methyl lysine readers and histone methyl transferases, and generated uh, uh, inhibitors against the KDMs. We've also started working on targeting the PhD fingers, which are methyl lysine readers, which can also allosterically modulate the catalytic activity and guide the substrate selectivity of associated JNJC KDMs to try to fine tune and balance the inhibition and the activities to specific substrates and for target specificity. Our most recent focus, um, my group has been to develop cyclic peptides against epigenetic proteins. Now, of course, small molecules remain the reagents of choice, um, but their small size means that the high affinity and selectivity can sometimes be difficult to achieve, which has been the case for some of the epigenetic targets and new KDMs as well. Um, peptides offer the diversity and complex 3D scaffolds covering immense chemical space. And of course, the cyclization, the cyclopeptide induces structural constraint, which increases affinity, metabolic stability, and in some cases, cell permeability. So, um, We've been developing these against um, epigenetic targets. Um, and um, the method that we use is called the rapid platform. So random non-standard peptide integrated discovery, which is based on a mRNA display pioneered by Jack Shostak. And this was further developed by Hirosuga, who integrated codon reprogramming and um, non-canonical amino acid incorporation using custom RNA enzymes. Um, and this allows for further chemical diversi diversification of the uh, peptide libraries, such as the one for used for peptide cyclization. And in brief, um, what this is, is an mRNA library that encodes for peptides of um, over 10 to the 12 diversity using NNK library of 12 mo, for example. And this is ligated to pyromycin and used as a template to ribosomally synthesize peptides using a cell-free in vitro translation system. Um, chloracetylated amino acid is reprogrammed um, as the methionine, uh, uh, reprogrammed to replace the initiating methionine at the end terminus. And this allows for spontaneous cyclization with a CE terminal cyst to form the stable thioether bonded cyclopeptides, which is then conveniently attached to its encoding on mRNA. And this is um, stabilized by reverse transcription and then applied to immobilize targets on the bees. A cyclic peptides that bind to the target of interest are then retained and the library is then used as an input to further enrich for higher affinity binders. And several iterations of this um, selection yields um, hip, hip peptides sequences um, through sequencing, so next-gen sequencing uh, or Sanger sequencing, and that, that could be then chemically synthesized for biochemical and biophysical validation and analysis. And this is a very powerful technique that allows for high affinity peptides to be efficiently identified. So we, we've uh, applied this platform um, in collaboration with Hero 
uh, on KDM4A, a histone demethylase that target the H3K9 and K36. So a number of hit peptides were identified through the selection and then chemically synthesized and tested as inhibitors for the catalytic activity. So three of the top peptide sequence showed excellent potency for the target KDM4A with exquisite selectivity for KDM4s of other KDM families. And interestingly, we also found that they could also um, discriminate within the KDM4 subfamily, demonstrating this um, uh, interest of family um, selectivity, which hadn't been achieved before. Um, uh, CP2 co-crystallizes KDM4 uh, and showed that C it anchors into the active site pocket where the histone substrate binds with arginine, where the methyl lysine of histone substrate occupy. And it forms a beta sheet and multiple intra and intermolecular bonds um, explaining its substrate, uh, its um, specificity and affinity. Um, the affinity is at 30 nanomolar compared to the histone peptides at 100, and the kinetic analysis showed that this was competitive with respect to histone substrate. So SAR studies showed that the cyclization was important in the potency uh, with fourfold reduction in, uh, when it's linear. And the basic residue at the arginine 6 position is important for binding as mutation to alanine or phenylalanine or even acetylated lysines would reduce activity, whereas changing to lysine um, uh, can retain activity. Another aspect of this work showed that CP2, which is very distinct um, sequence from histones, could also be turned into a substrate by replacing the arginine to trimethyl lysine. So, um, and more remarkably, when the arginine was methylated, it also became a substrate. So it could be uh, arginine or lysine demethylases of this substrate. So this, show, this shows that not only that CP2 invariants can bind in a productive manner, but also demonstrates that KDN4 um, can demethylate non-histone substrates very efficiently. And also um, it, um, synergized with the ongoing arginine demethylase activity uh, work. Um, and so demonstrating this, uh, how cyclic peptides can inform the biology of the target family. We next incorporated modifications inspired by natural product cyclic peptides to improve the stability and cell permeability of cyclic peptides, uh, CP2. And this included N-methylations, D-amino acid incorporations, as well as other mod um, unnatural modifications guided by crystallography. And combining these together and optimized for target potency and protolytic activity yielded CP2.3, which is a second generation cyclic peptide, um, which had enhanced cellular activity. Um, so these were tested in cells, as you can see here, both CP2 and CP3 showed target engagement in cells, uh, being able to stabilize cellular KDN4A in a concentration dependent manner, as demonstrated by SETSA. And CP2.3 had improved cellular potency as well in terms of um, increasing the, um, uh, the hypermethylation at the K9 methylation, K9 site. Uh, in a dose-dependent manner when CP2.3 was dosed over three days, suggesting that KDF4 demethylation activity is inhibited. So in subsequent work, we carried out work to, um, to improve the cell um, permeability and potency of this um, CP2 by um, um, maintaining the RSG and randomizing the um, either side of the sequence and also incorporating un, un, um, unnatural amino acids as well as um, different using different libraries and um, this enabled us to uh, increase the potency to 6 nanomolar from 42 nanomolar and also um, FITSI labeled um, cyclic peptides of these hits has shown that some of these in, improve the cellular uptake and um, so uh, we are now applying um, cyclic peptide platform on many other epigenetic targets to try to develop tools where we have not been able to generate selective molecules. And uh, we've 
yeah, apply this to the text. So um, uh, together with Suga group, Heroes Group, we've uh, published on cyclopeptide inhibitors of the human TET um, uh, one, um, that's more, uh, more selective. And um, we've also, uh, in another example of cyclopeptides applied to related to OG oxygenase, so HIF hydroxylases, uh, we identified in this case a non inhibitory cyclopeptide that bind protein at 100 to 150, um, uh, so, so 300 picomolar binding affinity. So very, very potent um, binders. But these are found to be um, bound in the allosteric site, so away from the active site, and can be um, and conserve the activity, the substrate binding at the same time. So this is a stabilizing protein, and what we found was that it enhanced crystallography. So we can then get co-crystal structures of the substrate and enzyme in a more rapid manner. So substantially. Uh, Pre, um, in the presence of cyclic peptides, the enzyme substrate complex co uh, crystallized within a week compared to substantially fewer crystals in over six months without the peptides. Also, it's found away from the active site, so it enabled rapid co crystallization efforts um, of small molecule active site inhibitors for structural biology. And so this, these are quite um, exciting uses of cyclic peptides. Also, Another application is that um, because of the potency um, of these binding uh, cyclopeptides, we can use this to um, capture um, uh, as affinity probes and antibody surrogates. And um, I don't have time to go through this in too much detail, but this is the work carried out by a, 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 a fantastic postdoc, Tom McAllister, my group, who showed that. Um, adding biotin handle enable us to um, pull down protein targets of interest from um, in endogenous levels from different cancer cell lines and also be able to co-purify its substrates as well. Um, so um, considering that the uh, synthetic tractability of cyclopeptides and the size at two to three kilodaltons compared to antibodies are, which are 150 kilodaltons, we believe this is a promising uh, antibody surrogate, and current work is ongoing to link this uh, to proteomic workflow, and uh, we've been applying this to epigenetic targets as well. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, the current and former members of my amazing team, uh, my many collaborators, and a special thanks to my long-term collaborators, especially for the um, Chris Schofield and his group, uh, colleagues at the Structural Genomics Consortium uh, in Oxford, and Hiro Suga's team at Turkey University, uh, in particular for the um, collaboration on cyclopeptides. Um, I'd like to thank the many funders who have supported my research over the years, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Akane, for, for a wonderful talk. Questions from panelists or attendees? Uh, question from Phil. Uh, yeah, that was a really exciting talk. I was intrigued by the hydroxylation of the piperidine lysine uh, analog. Did you map this? Is it is it a single oxygenation, um, or is it is it um, in different parts of the of the molecule? So we've been trying to identify where it's been um, um, hydroxylating, and actually there are several. We think there's several sites. And it's a time-dependent manner as well. Uh, we are, yes, we're, we're on the case, but it's 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 very quite it's quite tricky. Um, we found. Um, other questions for for Akane? Maybe I I can go with one. It's it's uh, wonderful to see the application of cyclic peptides both as a uh, uh, antibody surrogates and uh, pull down probes. Um, what do you think are some of the most intriguing cases where, where uh, cyclic peptide-based probes uh, um, could inform uh, uh, on, on uh, biological regulation? I, I was thinking about your uh, hypoxia example and how nice it might be to use those to investigate turnovers of, uh, of uh, uh, hypoxia regulators or their substrates. Definitely. And I, I think one of the challenges of the cyclic peptide uh, is the cell permeability. But if if 
many, um, the, uh, as you've seen with Acadia and Foresight Group that time, structure guided design had enabled um, cell permeable uh, peptides. So if we can actually get a robust method for cell permeable cell peptides, we will be able to do imaging uh, of targets in vivo, uh, in cellular, um, and also uh, looking yeah, at live of the interactions, protein-protein interactions that are happening. Uh, and so we are heading, we are trying to move towards that direction. And I think that that would be the significant impact that we could have in this area. Wonderful. Thank you, Akane, again. And uh, let's thank again all the morning speakers. Uh, we will take a short break now and reconvene in 17 minutes, so 10.15 uh, uh, Pacific time, 17 minutes uh, from now. See you all soon.
Hello. Hi. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. So it is 10.15 and uh, we will be starting the final session of the symposium. We have four talks, which will be followed by four flash talks. We, we have saved best for last with four trainees that uh, have uh, uh, submitted their, their abstract. So without further ado, our first speaker in this session is uh, June Chi from uh, Dana uh, Farber Kinson Institute in Boston. All right, great. All right, I hope everybody can see my slides. Yes. All right, thank you very much for the invitation. This is a really exciting to see all those great talks. And then today I'd like to share a little bit more of the, our story on how to using the chemistry or chemical biology approach to targeting the epigenetic proteins and how we can actually advance this, this into potential uh, therapeutic development for cancers. So this is a disclosure as I'd like to uh, uh, share with you guys. And then uh, um, I was uh, trained as a synthetic chemist. Uh, uh, after my training, I become more and more interesting to learn how we can using the chemistry or, or, or the small molecule to answer the question on the biology field. And then I uh, started at Dana Farber to study how to um, using the chemistry and the chemical biology platform to study the transcription factors and the blocks, the function of the chromatin modifying enzymes, as well as to targeting the histone binding domains. And I'm not gonna go through too much in the introduction as a lot of uh, uh, this basic concept has been introduced by multiple speakers. And then, but in general, the uh, epigenetic proteins is divided into uh, three major families, epigenetic radar, eraser, and uh, uh, writer proteins. And then this markers has been placed on the histone uh, uh, tails can be the methylated or acetylated. Uh, our study has been more focusing on the, on the histone methylation or histone uh, lysine acetylation uh, changes. And in the earlier study that I have conducted in Dr. James Brenner's lab, we have been targeting the radar protein, which is a major function is recognized the histone acetylated lysine side chain. We demonstrated that this proteins can be blocked or its function can be blocked by the small molecule inhibitors. This molecule can work in vitro and in vivo, give us more of the magnetic insight um, about the, uh, uh, their functions. So uh, as this as the same point uh, time point, and this molecule actually can be used to evaluate the therapeutic potential of those targets. More importantly, with the development of a small molecule uh, targeting the BET bromodomains, we identify the different mechanism or different partners that interact with the bromodomain and that their function uh, in a different type of cancers that intrigued us to further explore this uh, area further. And over the past 12 years, and then the bromodomain has been one of the uh, 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 protein family has been uh, uh, studied by multiple groups. You can see along those process, the chemistry and the biology are uh, together to, get, to gain more of the learning of, uh, knowledge for us to understand its function, that including generally the biotinated molecule to do beyond the pull down and to generate the, uh, we call the chemsec to understand where the protein goes. And then the BT bromodomy has been used utilized to demonstrate the chemical biology approach using the protein can degrade those proteins as well. It can also generate the molecule bind to the multiple domains at the same time. And also even using the uh, structure guided design, we can generate the uh, small molecule can in, uh, interrupt the specific uh, domain functions as well. All this knowledge to teach us that targeting the epigenetic proteins can bring up a lot of magnetic insight at the same time uh, to bring a, a lot of 
uh, therapeutic potentials as well. And in the last year, we actually come up together with this uh, review with uh, Adam Durbin, and now he has his own group at St. Jude. And then to summarize the recent chemical advan advancement in the development of the small molecule inhibitor or degraded to targeting the epigenetic proteins. And Logan here uh, in my group summarizes this big table to um, include uh, most of the uh, molecules that are targeting the epigenetic proteins. A lot of them actually are as a clinic trial stage. And then last year, the, uh, the EZH2 inhibitor has been approved by the FDA further demonstrate this as a class of the protein that can bring the uh, potential clinical benefit for cancer patients as well. And uh, we have been uh, focused on also uh, one, uh, 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 one type of epigenetic uh, protein is eraser protein. And I'm not going to go to detail with this as a uh, too much of the, its function, but in general, the uh, eraser is the protein removes the marks that has been placed by the writer proteins. And then uh, uh, my team has been getting more and more interesting into targeting the methylation mark and also the proteins that regulate this methylation mark, including the histone methyltransferase and the histone demethylase. And among the histone demethylase, they have been divided into seven subfamilies. Uh, KDM1 is also an LSD family. They normally conduct the removal of the di or monomethylation uh, mark. And then the 227 normally conducting the removal of the trimethyl to uh, di or monomethylation. And there are a couple of the studies showcased that as the epigenetic erasers or the KDMs has uh, played an important role in different type of cancers. Um, however, the, the, the therapeutic potential of targeting the KDM5 has not been fully evaluated. We have been become very interested in this uh, target is because that our collaborator, Dr. Ken Anderson, has been studying the multiple myeloma for over years, and then they identified KDM5A are associated with the poor survival in the multiple myeloma patients. And by working together with them, we identified KDM5A is uniformly overexpressed or in the multiple myeloma cell line, as well as patient sample, but not in the normal uh, B cells. So by knock, uh, knock down the KDM5A, we'll see a more dramatic effect in the cell growth inhibition, but not that much of the KDM5B or C. So this brings a good question that how can we target the KDM5? And then uh, um, um, we have looked into how to block this catalytic core of the KDM5 as um, the uh, we as reported in the literature, there are multiple uh, good probes has been reported before. However, this probe has some of the drawback to study the KDM5 uh, inhibition in vitro, particularly in vivo to, uh, for the cancer research as well. So including the compound C49, which is really tight binder. However, this carboxylic acid motif prevents this molecule get into the cell and then they don't have the good cellular activity. On the other end, some of the probe like CPI455, they are good selective inhibitor, but their cellular activity or in vivo activity is still modest. In order to uh, uh, develop the novel inhibitor, we are also trying to target the different pocket. At the same time, we want to see by using the drug uh, delivery strategy, like utilizing the medicinal chemistry, if we can generate the probe that allow us to increase the uh, drug concentration in vitro or in vivo, and then improve the uh, drug potency at the same time, allow us to study the mechanism of the KDM5 inhibition in multiple myeloma. We designed the two molecules, even though they are very, very similar, but this molecule KD82 provide a much better um, uh, uh, if, if, if efficiency to, in, to deliver the compound into the cell. They show those molecules maintain the similar potency and the selectivity as a CPI-455, but this is a prodrug when it's getting a cell that becomes a C49, which is a much more potent as well. We generated the co-crystal structure together 
Whereas with the open mass lab at the SGC Oxford, this structure showed that actually the acid is cleaved during even the crystallization condition and then the acid is an active component bind to the KDM5. And we ass assess uh, the concentration of the compound, both parent compound and active component C49 in cell. And this our molecule bring uh, much more compound into the cell. This also explains the high uh, in cell potency. Uh, we observed that we can compare the compound with C70, which is the alpha ester, and then the C49. Our molecule uh, can largely increase H3K4 trimethylation at a, a much lower concentration. The molecule remains a similar selectivity, and then only H3K4 trimethylation uh, uh, goes up after the treatment. It does provide us a much better cellular activity against the multiple myeloma. And then the, a lot of multiple myeloma uh, also responds to the KDM5 inhibition as we expected. We then assess this molecule in the cellular, uh, in the patient samples. And then the, a lot of patient samples also respond to this KDM5 inhibitors, but not the normal stimulated B cells. So this uh, also indicated this molecule can, or KDM5 inhibition could have a pretty big window for the multiple myeloma patients. And we do observe that with the compound treatment, this go on to the G0, G1 uh, arrest with the cell, which mimic the KDM5 uh, A knockout. And then uh, after the prolonged treatment, we will see the apoptosis. We then look into the uh, gatekeeper, gatekeeper gene uh, that uh, control the G0, G1 uh, status. And then we identify MIG is one of the key player uh, with the KDM5, either the knockdown or uh, the, the uh, inhibition. And so this uh, data showed that with the KDM5 being knocked down or knocked out, we can see the MIC down, was down regulated, but not a five or KDM5 B or 5C. And this further been confirmed by the chip seek. And then we look into the mechanism, and then the KDM5 A uh, knockdown showed that it's, the, the KDM5 is co localized together with the MIC and the CDK7, CDK9, and the are NAPOL2. So this uh, bring into the good question, like how this mechanism work? And then in the same strategy, similar comparis comparison, by comparing the KDM5 inhibition, and we also observe the MIC is downregulated as well with a small molecule inhibitor. And then uh, we did as a IP mass spec. If I pull down the KDM5A, we noticed that the CCNT2 and the CDK9 was pulled down at the same time. This has been confirmed by the Western blot as well. And then we did the co-IP in the uh, uh, normal uh, multiple myeloma cells. And we observed that when we pulled down the KDM5A, the CCNT2 get pulled down. It's, it's the same when, the, uh, when we do the reverse pull down, the KDM5A show as well with the CCNT2. So we, uh, we propose this mechanism, the KDM5 interact with the CCNT2 and the CDK9 uh, by recruiting the PTAB B complex and then recruit MIC, then open the RNA or activate the RNA pol 2 We generate a small molecule about to do the bouting pull down. Interestingly, we pull down the KDM5A at the same time we pull down the CCNT2 and the CDK9. This also indicated the small molecule inhibition will not interrupt those interactions. Then how the small molecule by increased H3K4 trimethylation block the same pathway or similar pathway as the KDM5A uh, knockdown, knockout, sorry. So we then look into the, uh, we conduct the, the chip seek and then identify the uh, KDM5A knockdown. Uh, inhibition also can uh, reduce the, um, serin 2 and serin 5 phosphorylation. And then at the same time, we look into uh, what is the mechanism behind the H3K4 trimethylation increase. And then in the literature, there is a report that KDM3 K4, H3K4 trimethylation, um, one, it's 
uh, with, with a high level of H3K4 trimethylation. And this will lock uh, one of the TAF3, which is a component of TF2D uh, complex to really block the RNA pol 2 activation. So our chip sequencing data further confirm this is a potential mechanism using the small molecule. We confirmed that the small uh, KDM5 inhibition or KDM5 knockdown will overall block the RNA pol 2 activation, but how it does it the, or how they did it are different. And then the um, editor from the block cancer discovery used this picture and really capture the effect of how the KDM5 um, inhibition versus the KDM5 knockdown and really uh, block the uh, RNA pol 2 activation as well. So the next question is if this molecule can work in vivo. And uh, very luckily that uh, we re I recruit this uh, talented postdoc, Ting Jian, uh, right uh, before uh, we started the animal study, he built up this models by working together with the Ken's lab. We conducted as a, a study, we show the KDM5 probe we have can actually uh, uh, reduce the tumor progression and also prolong the survival. At the same time, we generate the sub-Q model that allow us to push the dose even higher. And then at the same time, with the uh, PD study show, we can observe the MIC was downregulated as we expected with the H3K4 trimethylation level goes up. So at the end, we, we confirmed that our molecule that can be used for the in vitro and in vivo study. At the same time, we have been looking into if any other cancer type will respond to it. And then we did the PRISM uh, screening and then that show this molecule has a very good activity against the panel of other cancers, which we are undergoing follow up with this uh, different type of cancers. So here is an example that sometimes the inhibitor will have uh, the different uh, give the same outcome, but it has a different mechanism of action. And sometimes it might not be really re uh, help us to dissect as a function of a targeted protein. I'm gonna like to uh, give you another quick example, which is a uh, uh, unpublished work and it, uh, on the targeting the P300 in neuroblastoma. We have been working together with uh, Dr. Adam Durbin uh, uh, while he, he was a postdoc in uh, Tom Locke and uh, uh, Kim Stegmaier's lab to study the uh, 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 EP300 function in the neuroblastoma. Uh, neuroblastoma is a pediatric cancer and the make an amplified neuroblastoma is a, has a very poor survival rate. And then the patient with the, with the treatment normally has a severe um, um, a side effect. That's why it's important to generate uh, effective and also less toxic strategy to go targeting the protein that in, the, uh, um, in this uh, cancers. And then, um, Dr. Durbin's work has demonstrated that as a CRC member in the neuroblastoma play a very critical role. However, direct targeting them, including targeting the MIC N is almost impossible at this stage. And then we have been looking into the uh, enzymes that in interact with all the CRC member. Interestingly, uh, Adam identified as a P300 is very uniquely interact with the CRC member, but now it's partner the uh, CBP. As Phil has mentioned before, the P300 and CBP are very, very close and targeting them selectively become a very challenge uh, um, uh, chemically. And then, however, the, uh, the study uh, uh, we did here together with Tom's lab and uh, Kim's lab showed that neoblastoma is much more uh, dependent on the P300 function, but not the CBP. We have looked at the interaction between the CBP with the CRC members identified as a unique interaction of the CBP with the, uh, uh, with, sorry, P300 with the CRC member, but some of those interactions not interfere uh, by or interact with the CBP. Uh, for example, the TFAP2 beta is one of those, they only, it only interact with P300, but not CBP. So this gave us a very strong rationale if we can selectively target the P300 in the neuroblastoma, they might give us a good way to targeting the, uh, those epigenetic proteins in uh, generate the uh, new therapeutic strategy. Oops. 
Um, in order to do so, we have we have been looking into what how we can design a small molecule to do so. Both P300 and CUP has been uh, listed as a, a very uh, a target for, for not just the academic, but also the industry to targeting over years. However, this large similarity makes the selective inhibition, it become a really challenge. And then this is the structure, uh, crystal structure of the head and the bromodomy between the P300 and CVP. You can see they're almost identical. Uh, Phil has developed this C646, which uh, targeting the head domain. And last, uh, last two years, the A45 also showed that it blocks the catalytic function of the head. We also go try to target the bromodomain of the CVP, but all those compounds are non selective. And then this molecule, especially the A4A5, shows a pretty good potency against the P300 and CVP. And, and then it does block the uh, uh, neoblastoma cell growth. However, all the cell growth happen, uh, inhibition happen much slower. They require about five to seven days to induce the apoptosis. And also, uh, um, so it's it doesn't quite match with what we observed with or we expected with the um, key uh, interaction of the uh, uh, P300 with the CRC members. So in order to uh, effectively target the P300, so we utilize the uh, degrader strategy that uh, uh, I briefly mentioned be, uh, before. So in general, is uh, using the bifunction molecule to link the target protein to the E3 ligase. This dimerization will induce the polyubiquitination of the target protein and induce the degradation. In this case, a lot of different E3 ligase binder has been utilized in the literature, and we normally using the cerebellum as our uh, um, uh, E3 ligase binder to uh, as E3 ligase to conduct the degradation. And at, uh, three years ago, I generated this molecule on my birthday when I have nothing to do. And then luckily this molecule does degrade the P300. And also we, uh, we by working together with item, we have uh, identified this molecule can kill this uh, neoblastoma cell at a much uh, earlier time point. And then more interestingly, this molecule actually shows the selectivity against the P300. And then they degrade the P300 P300 at start of the 24 hours, but the CVP get degraded at a much later time point. And then we generate the biotin data to pull down probes that we actually put on the cerebellum and the P300 at the same time, but not with the CVP. This selectivity has been further confirmed by the proteomic study. So we're very happy to see this molecule actually are selectively degrades a, a, a uh, uh, P300. Even this, there is a window, uh, we observe this selectivity observed in the multiple uh, different neuroblastoma neuro cell lines. And with this the selectivity, is, is, uh, uh, we confirm this molecule degradation is dependent on the cerebellum. Without the cerebellum, or when we knock out the cerebellum, we don't observe any degradation. And by compared to the degrader versus the inhibitor, we can see the apoptosis and the uh, uh, sub-G uh, phase is much, happened much earlier with the degrader. And more importantly, by looking at the mechanism, we do see the with the degrader at the 24 hours, most of the CRC member goes down and not until uh, 40 hours, when then we'll see more of the global, a lot of genes goes down. So this also means targeting the P300 selectively by eliminating the whole protein that the pro will give the more profound uh, impact on the, uh, the CRC members. The next question is, as a degrader, can we use it for the in vivo study? Can this molecule still remain the selectivity against the P300 in animal? And the Tingen, again, takes a challenge to build this model uh, uh, using the neoblastoma cell lines. And we do observe with the 40 meg per cake daily treatment, we, uh, the, uh, there's a tumor progression inhibition with the uh, degrader. We observe the survival benefit, and then uh, there's no weight loss with the 40 meg per cake daily treatment. Uh, 
the tumor does show that with this dosage after uh, uh, 10 days of the treatment, we observe the P300 is selectively de degraded but not CDP. Even in the liver, we have the same observation, the P300 goes down, but not the CBP. This also gave us hope that only touching the P300, not CBP, may provide the uh, uh, lower toxicity with the, our strategy. And we do observe that, that the molecules also work in the neuroblastoma pre primary samples, and as it does has a, a low toxicity compared to the inhibitor in the primary fibroblast. And we did as a PRISM screening at the Broad Institute. This also further confirmed our molecule that has a different profile with the inhibitor, which as we expected. And hopefully uh, this uh, with the, the, the selective, uh, selective degrader plus the inhibitors, we can understand the P300 CBP function even a little bit more. So the overall, uh, I didn't go through either the story in a lot of detail and then, but I will be, hopefully we'll be, have more chance to sh share this story in the, uh, in the publication very soon. But overall, my life is really enjoy that uh, utilizing the chemistry to answer the question that uh, behind that different target inhibition and look into using the combined chemistry and biology approach to identify or find a new therapy for the cancer patient. At the same time, I would like to use this as a chance to uh, put a little bit of advisement, uh, advertisement here that we're recruiting talented uh, scientists to join us. And then uh, here is, is a, a nice facility at Dana Farber for the chemical biology program. And uh, I'd like to thank all my team member uh, and a particular uh, Dr. Durbin now has his own lab at uh, uh, St. Judas, still willing to wear my lab jack uh, jacket and uh, be part of the uh, family. And uh, then I'd like to thank all the collaborators, uh, particularly Tom Locke and uh, Kim Stegmaier and uh, Ken Anderson on those two projects. And uh, we're looking forward to keep working together with all of them uh, and as well as uh, Adam Durbin's lab to get more uh, of our probe into uh, the clinic investigation. We'd like to thank all the foundations and NIH for their support. And, uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity. And then I'd like to, I would love to answer any of the questions you have. Thank you, June. Um, wonderful talk. We have one question in Q&A uh, box. It comes from Matyaj Barboric. He says, great talk. I'm particularly interested in uh, cycling T2 data, have you confirmed genetically the reliance of your model on cycling T2? Can T1, uh, uh, an alternative PTFP complex substitute for T2 loss? So this is a great question. I think in, uh, we haven't yet. The answer is we are looking into that. We have been uh, in the, our first story with Ken's group where more are comparing the KDM5 knockdown versus uh, uh, or knockout versus the small molecule inhibition. And then to put the picture between the protein subfamily versus uh, uh, the, uh, the catalytic function inhibition. So there is a lot of questions we try to answer as well. And then uh, we're hoping that we will be able to have more follow-up story to tell you guys on that. Uh, Phil? Yeah, great talk, June. Thank uh, you. So, so um, on the first part of your talk with KDM5, uh, I guess I, I hadn't followed things as closely. So you see increases in, in lysine 4 trimethylation, um, but in general, the genes you've looked at, you see um, silencing or repression, even though we think of K4 trimethylation as an activation mark. Do, do you see particular genes that do go up and any increased acetylation um, ever accompanying KDM5? Uh, yeah. Inhibition? Yes, this is a great question. Yes, the H3 K4 trimethylation is considered as an activation mark. We do see a lot of mark goes up as we you know expected as well. And the most interesting part is we do see anything controlled by the TAF3 seems comes down. So I think this is a more particular event in probably in the uh, multiple myeloma that by really uh, 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 prevent the TAF 2D complex uh, uh, de-associated with uh, the RNA pol 2 uh, through those H3K4 trimethylation. 
So this is a more, um, uh, uh, and also that probably also that uh, the, the, the unique part of this could also rely on the biology behind the multiple myeloma that depend on the RNA pol 2 uh, activations as well. So, but I do, we do think, think there are, um, there, there are quite a bit of the gene get it upregulated with H3K4 trimethylation and those up. Thanks, and if I, if I could ask one more quick question. So yes. on the second part, it's very intriguing uh, about the P300 selectivity. Um, I won't ask you what the mechanistic basis for that is, because that's probably hard to determine, but um, is, in general, some people have speculated that when cells are more sensitive to P, 300 drop, um, knockdown versus CBP knockdown, it has to do with the overall protein expression of either of the isoforms. In the neuroblastoma that you've looked at, do you have a sense that at baseline, one is more dominant than the other? So this is a great question. Uh, we do, we do, uh, uh, we, I didn't, I did go through this data really quick. So, uh, but we did compare uh, in the literature or, or, or the data, uh, the public database, we do see they are in general expressed in the same level. We did the Western blood as well, compared they are also expressed in a similar level. And then the question for us, in general, our hypothesis is, where it interact uh, will be very different. And then, or a location of those, uh, either of those will be very, very different. We're trying to do more of the follow-up on that as well. But the neoblastoma is a fairly unique as well. We do think where we, when we see that, uh, um, the, the more of the dependency on the P300, the first thing we did check is the protein expression level. They, they're very, very similar in the Thank level. You. Thank you. We will move on to the next talk. And our next speaker is Lindsay James, who is joining us from Chapel Hill. Great. Thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. OK, can you all see that OK? Yep, looks okay. great. Great, thank you. Um, so I want to thank the organizers and everyone involved um, in coordinating the symposium uh, for the gracious invitation um, to speak among this really fantastic group of speakers. Um, it's been really exciting to see such great progress in the field, um, as well as in a few cases, seeing some molecules from UNC um, being put to good use. Um, and so I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share a little bit of our work in the area of um, regulating um, um, histone methylation with methylacine reader uh, targeted chemical probes as well as degraders, which were nicely introduced by June. Um, so, you know, as the other speakers have said, you know, there's really no need to go into too much background um, on chromatin here. Um, and, and after all the beautiful talks we've seen, um, you know, this topic has been nicely introduced. But our main interest lies in these different classes of proteins or chromatin regulatory factors that intimately work together to regulate post-translational modifications. And so as has been introduced, this includes the writers that install the modifications, uh, the erasers that can remove the modifications, as well as the readers that non-covalently recognize these modifications. And so these classes of proteins work together to maintain a delicate balance of gene activation and repression at specific low cyan time points, um, which is critical for both normal development and the prevention of disease. Uh, so the problem that, that we're really interested in, it lies in the fact that the dysregulation of these epigenetic regulatory proteins is an emerging hallmark of disease. And so this can, can um, you know, be facilitated in a number of different ways, um, such as overexpression, mutation, translocation, or aberrant recruitment of these proteins, um, which regulate the epigenome. And so examples of these types of um, misregulation of these proteins are, are rapidly emerging. Um, and the way in which we tackle this problem as medicinal chemists and chemical biologists is through the development of small molecule chemical probes, um, which either bind or inhibit these proteins when they are misregulated. And so we think about developing chemical probes with three main goals in mind. Um, first, to enable an increased biological understanding of the targets we're going after. Um, sometimes there's very little known about these targets. Um, in some cases, validating novel targets for bigger drug discovery efforts. Um, and then in some cases, using the molecules that we develop to translate directly into therapeutics. 
And so my lab is particularly interested in the development of chemical probes for methylacine reader proteins. Um, and so these proteins recognize or read methylated lysine residues through protein-protein interactions, similarly to how the well-known BET bromodomains read acetylated lysine. Um, and they tend to bind through this aromatic cage um, as shown here on the left, um, through a number of different aromatic residues which interact through uh, hydrophobic as well as cation pi interactions with the methylated lysine. Um, these readers can also um, interact with specific methylacine residues on the histone tail, um, as well as specific methylation states, so mon or di or trimethylated lysine. Um, and so over here on the right, you can see the different families of methylacine reader proteins that recognize the different modifications on the H3 or H4 tails. Um, and although these domains themselves don't have enzymatic activity, they're often part of larger proteins or protein complexes um, that contain catalytic activity or enzymatic activity um, that are able to themselves alter the post-translational modification um, landscape. And so my lab has worked on a number of different proteins within these families, um, just some of which I've highlighted in yellow here, um, some of the work of which is published and some is ongoing. Um, and as um, was just recently introduced in the last talk, in addition to the development of small molecule antagonists, um, my lab is also thinking about using novel chemical probes to enable protein degradation. Um, and so um, there are many things that need to fall into place in order to enable successful degradation of a protein. And um, I will just briefly outline how these degraders work. Uh, so we develop these bivalent compounds, um, as shown by this cartoon up here. These are large molecules that first need to be able to penetrate the cell membrane and get into the cell. Uh, they need to engage both an E3 ligase complex, as well as the protein of interest, in our case, often a methylacine reader protein, in a productive fashion without steric clash. Um, then this ternary complex ideally can facilitate ubiquitylation of the protein of interest um, on an available lysine residue. And then ultimately that ubiquitin acts as a signal for degradation by the proteasome. And so there are a number of key advantages um, to targeted protein degradation. Um, for example, this um, strategy enables elimination of the target of interest um, so you're really taking a hammer to the protein and using a chemical approach um, to mimic genetic knockout of the protein. Um, it's event-driven versus occupancy-driven pharmacology, so only a transient binding event is required for activity, uh, in contrast to stoichiometric site occupancy of um, uh, occupancy-driven model. Um, the ligands also don't necessarily need, need to bind to the active site of the protein, so they just need to grab on anywhere in the protein, potentially in an allosteric site. Um, you can also get extended durability to, due to this kinetic advantage as well as potential for increased specificity. And so these are just a few reasons that um, the chemical biology community um, is, as well as the drug discovery community, is so excited about um, this strategy as a way to target um, both epigenetic proteins and proteins, uh, you know, other classes of proteins. However, we think that um, methylacine readers are really an ideal target class for protect development. Um, and there are a number of reasons that we think that, but it is ultimately rooted in the fact that uh, multivalency drives chromatin recognition. Um, and so many um, epigenetic regulatory proteins that have reader domains um, have multiple reader domains or multiple domains that um, act in a cooperative fashion to recognize chromatin. So again, methylacine readers are generally large multi-domain proteins. And so going into, um, you know, when planning a, a project around discovering a ligand for some of these proteins, we often lack knowledge um, a priori of the best domain to target in order to elicit the desired biological effect. Um, without doing elaborate genetic studies involving point mutants or domain truncations. In addition, due to their multivalent interactions, um, antagonism of a single reader domain may not be sufficient to sphenocopy genetic knock knockdown results. Um, methylacine readers have been shown um, to be fairly difficult drug targets in some cases, um, using more traditional approaches that require high target occupancy. Um, 
And then last, methylase inhibitors often contain a catalytic domain or recruit these protein complexes with enzymatic activity. And so by degrading them, we can alter this catalytic activity as well. Um, so we've been thinking recently about developing methylation reader targeted protex as a way to allosterically regulate histone methyltransferase activity. Um, and so one example where we've been successful in doing so is with EED targeted degraders. Um, and this work was published early last year. So I'm just gonna go through a, a brief snippet of this, this work today. Um, but we were motivated to um, enter this area for a number of different reasons. Um, as many of you may know, EZH2 um, overexpression and gain of function mutants were identified in several tumor types years ago, um, particularly lymphomas, um, exciting the community around developing inhibitors of um, EZH2. Um, and additionally, the methylysine reader domain of EED, which is another component of PRC2, has been shown to allosterically regulate EZH2 catalytic activity. Um, and so again, there's been compounds that have entered the clinic, both targeting EED um, as well as EZH2 um, for, for a number of different cancers. And so we were able to show that with a bivalent degrader, UNC 6852, um, which uses VHL um, as the um, E3 ligase component to facilitate degradation, um, that excitingly, when we use a ligand targeting EED, we see in a dose-dependent fashion, not only degradation of EED, as well as degradation of EZH2 and SUS12, the other core components of PRC2. Um, and upon loss of PRC2, not surprisingly, this leads to a decrease in H3K27 trimethyl levels as shown in the middle. And then if this time point gets extended even further, we see a more significant drop in methylation. Um, and then this loss in methylation uh, leads to a, um, an anti-proliferative phenotype in looking um, in different DLBCL cell lines that contain an EZH2 gain of function um, mutant. And so, you know, this really shows um, a potential um, alternative strategy to target PRC2 um, that also may be useful in overcoming acquired resistance to EZH2 inhibitors and could be used as a complementary therapeutic strategy to compounds currently in clinical development. It was also the first example of targeted degradation of a methylacine reader protein, um, as well as targeting a single um, component of a complex that led to degradation of the entire protein complex. Um, and so from here, um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about our efforts um, on another protein, um, NSD2. And so while, while inhibition of K27 methylation has clearly been a viable strategy, uh, therapeutic strategy in a number of different contexts, a regulation of K36 methylation has received a bit, a bit um, less, um, has received less attention to date. And um, these two marks, K27 and K36, are intimately related and um, in most cases mutually exclusive. Um, and so we became interested in looking at the proteins that regulate K36 methylation, one of which is NSD2, uh, which is a methyl transfer transferase belonging to the NSD family. It is a, a fairly large multi-domain protein, so it contains both a set domain as well as a number of different reader domains shown in pink and blue here. Um, and it's known for its ability to both non mono and dimethylate K36 um, to facilitate the installation and propagation of these marks. However, the mechanism as far as exactly how, this, how it does this, whether it's inter or intranucleosomal um, is still a little bit up in the air. Um, and so NSD2 um, does have therapeutic relevance in a number of different cancers. One of the key places it's been implicated is in multiple myeloma. Um, as well as ALL and prostate cancer. Um, but about 15 to 20% of multi-myeloma patients carry a translocation, um, which essentially leads to NSD2 overexpression and therefore upregulation of H3K36 dimethylation and inappropriate activation of oncogenes. Um, and so this has been studied for about over a decade now um, with Jonathan Lick being one of the leaders in the field and looking at the role of NSD2 in cancer. Um, and in this case here, they showed that in uh, multi-myeloma xenograft model system, 
um, that a translocation knockout as well as NSD2 mutant cells failed to grow following IP injection, um, whereas cat catalytically um, active NSD2 restores tumor genicity um, in these T4 negative multiple myeloma cells. And so we thought it was pretty clear that, you know, with this large protein, that pharmacological tools were needed to better understand the role of some of these individual reader domains in NSD2 and validate NSD2 as a viable target in oncology. And so um, this work has been a close collaboration with the Structural Genomics Consortium in Toronto. And we started this work um, doing a virtual screen um, against a number of different PWWP um, targeted um, compounds. And so NSD2 has two PWWP domains, one of which is at the very end terminus of the protein. And so we generated some early hit compounds as shown in the middle here that bind PWWP1 of NSD2 um, with the KD of about 25 micromolar. Um, but there were some aspects of these, this molecule that made it fairly unattractive from a medicinal chemistry standpoint. Um, and so we did some scaffold hopping to improve the synthetic tractability um, of our lead compound leading to this molecule here, um, which is about seven micromolar. So it had slightly improved potency, um, but we lost our chiral centers, um, had a bit more of a simple modular synthesis, um, and we could make a number of different analogs based on uh, building block availability. And so in the next slide, I'm probably going to summarize a ton of medicinal chemistry um, in a very short time, led by two really talented former, now former postdocs in my lab, Ronan Hanley and Naomi Menta, um, who spent about two years optimizing um, that compound into our current chemical probe. Um, but we took a look at a number of different hits, and this just gives you uh, or a number of different compounds along the progression um, that led to this compound here, this lactam thiophene containing compound, which broke the micromolar barrier and had a KD of about 400 nanomolar by SPR. Um, through some additional optimization, um, we eventually landed on UNC6934, um, which is a um, 90 nanomolar binder of the N-terminal PWWP domain of NSD2, um, as determined by, by SPR. We also developed um, a very close analog um, as a negative control compound. So switching from this cyclopropyl to the isopropyl um, essentially abrogates binding just due to the slight change in difference of size of that moiety of the molecule. But it's really nice to have a comparable compound um, as a, a negative control for cellular studies. Um, we next use it, used um, an alpha screen assay with H3K36 dimethylnucleosomal substrates, and we found that um, our compound UNC6934 is able to block the interaction between NSD2 PWWP1 and this methylated nucleosome substrate um, with an IC50 of about 50 nanomolar. However, when we moved to using the full length protein, um, we found that the compound no longer is sufficient to disengage full length from nucleosomes. Um, and so we thought that the electrostatic interactions between the full length NSG2 and potentially the DNA of the nucleosomes um, may be preventing displacement of NSG2 by UNC6934. Um, and so we repeated the experiment in the presence of um, excess salmon sperm DNA. Um, and again, then we're able to regain the effect of um, UNC6934 and its ability to displace NSD2 um, from nucleosomes. But this really reiterated the point that NSD2 binding to nucleosomes is multivalent. Um, so in collaboration with Jinrong Ming at the Structured Genomics Consortium, we solved the co-crystal structure of 6934. Um, it does bind in the um, aromatic cage where the methylated lysine binds. Um, and this site is also really in very close proximity to um, the surface that binds DNA um, as well. We next move on to look at, at the cellular efficacy of the compound using a nanobret assay um, and generated an EC50 of about one micromolar, um, again, using a traditional nanobret assay, whereas our negative control compound essentially has no effect. And similarly, if we use um, in NS, a point mutant in the PWWP domain, we no longer um, engage NSD2 PWWP1 in cells. Um, and we also have no effect using um, NSD3 P 
PWWP1, which is the closest related PWWP domain within the family. Uh, we next generated a um, biotinylated analog of our probe um, based on a known site where we knew based on the crystal structure, we could add this large bulky um, portion of the molecule without abrogating binding. Um, and we did some um, chemiprecipitation studies and showed that NSD2 is essentially selectively pulled down within the proteome um, using this reagent, um, using a proteomics based analysis. Um, as well as we were able to analyze by Western blot, um, uh, further demonstrating the selectivity of the compound. And so ultimately we wanted to look and see if the compound had effect on the maintenance of global K36 methylation. Um, and we see minimal effect um, on methylation with the compound alone. And this is not entirely surprising based on the fact that we anticipate this multivalent engagement um, with all the reader domains. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with two quick points. Um, one being that we were curious to see what antagonism of the PWWP1 does in cells. Um, and so um, there are three different isoforms of NSD2. One of the shorter isoforms lacks the PWWP domain. Um, and it had been shown to promote nucleolar localization. And we wanted to see if our compounds um, resulted in a similar phenotype. And so indeed, when we um, look at our compounds, uh, treatment of cells by confocal microscopy, looking at NSD2 and fibrillarin staining, which is a marker of the nucle nucleolus, we do see enhanced um, localization in the, with the nucleolus um, upon compound treatment, again, suggesting that antagonizing the domain has a similar effect to truncating that part of the protein in cells. This also seems to be cooperative with other um, mutations in some of the other reader domains, such as the PhD domains or the second PWWP2, the second PWWP domain. Um, and so there are cooperative effects between antagonizing PWWP1 with mutants in some of the other domains, um, as shown here. Again, emphasizing the point that all of these domains are working together to, know, to localize the protein to the nucleus. And when they get disrupted, we see relocalization to um, the nucleolus. Um, and so we did some computational studies to predict some of these nucleolar localization sequences um, that you know, um, further um, supported this idea. Um, and this work was all recently uh, accepted um, at Nature Chemical Biology and hopefully will be out soon um, with, with more detail. But we were able to show that the compounds do have an effect in the cells, even though they don't influence methylation. Um, you might be able to guess where we're going next. Um, now we have a potent handle that can grab onto NSD2. And so we're using this compound now um, to develop um, NSD2 targeted degraders. Um, and so we can append our NSD2 chemical probe to different um, E3 ligands. And we have been able to successfully um, degrade NSD2 uh, using these types of molecules. And so we both have a, a chemical probe and then we're able to use that probe um, to generate compounds that have distinct pharmacology. And in contrast to the chemical probe, these degraders do reduce global H3K, H3K36 methylation um, when you degrade the protein. So with that, I will um, wrap up, um, thank a number of different people in the lab, um, Frankie, a former postdoc led the PRC2 work, as well as Ronan and Amy, who have been um, really outstanding um, leaders on the NSD2 project, which was a close collaboration with the Structural Genomics Consortium. Um, and then I'll thank my funding sources and I'm happy to take any questions. Beautiful talk, Lindsay. Uh Sorry, it took me a second to uh, unmute. I really enjoyed uh, uh, all aspects of it, both from ligand discovery to medicinal chemistry to, mm -hmm. to target occupancy and mode of action. So truly terrific. Great, uh, thank you. Questions? Maybe I'll start. It's really intriguing to see that uh, um, dissociating only chromatin mark off of the reader domain um, is a, uh, um, not sufficient, exactly as you pointed out, that multivalent interactions with other uh, segments of the protein are, uh, uh, are uh, promoting uh, its localization to chromatin. 
um, perfect setup for products, the, the <laughs> direction that you're pursuing, right, with, with them, with eliminating the entire protein scaffold. What do you anticipate will be major differences other than nucleolar, nucleolar localization? You mean for the NSG2 degraders versus the chemical probes? Yeah. Yeah, well, so based on the, the preliminary data we have so far, we think that we're more, you know, we are able to see changes in methylation when you degrade the protein, because again, you're, um, it's more likely to be comparable to an inhibitor of the set domain, um, which folks have been working on, and there are currently no potent set domain inhibitors. Um, and we've also seen some preliminary, you know, um, anti-proliferative effects in multiple, multiple myeloma models. Now, you know, if you eliminate the protein, we're probably not going to get the extent of nucleolar relocalization. But, you know, with Protax, there is this balance between degrading and potentially some, um, you know, phenotype due to antagonism or inhibition, you know, alone. So, you know, I think that's a, a fantastic point. And we really are interested in using you know, our probes to generate protax that have distinct pharmacology from the ligand alone, as opposed to, you know, using small molecules that work really well and just making them, you know, potentially a little better, which I mean, that has some value too. Um, but I think with, with the way readers work and the fact that there's so many, you know, sometimes you need to target multiple within a protein to really have an effect. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the introduction, Protex seemed to be like a, a, you know, a very good strategy to apply to this target class. Beautiful. Uh, do we have, Vijay, um, would you like to, to unmute and ask? Oh, okay, sure. Um, so it's, it's a super broad question, um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm basically wondering if, you know, when developing new Protex, have you found particular targets where they're recalcitrant to degradation, possibly because of you know where they're localized subnuclearly or something, right? And and if so, have 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 you or has anyone else thought about trying to say survey all of the nuclear or nucleolar or subnuclear localized ubiquitin ligases to try to find other targets that could be more effective in terms of creating new chemically inducible pairs? Yeah, so I, I think that's a great question, a broad question for the field, probably in general, and. We probably, as a small academic lab, have not done enough work to ourselves have the data points to really assess. Um, you know, I can say, you know, I think the idea of um, using E3 ligases that are potentially overexpressed, for example, in cancer or in certain tumor types, you know, might be a great way to achieve um, selectivity or tumor specificity. And so that's definitely an area um, that folks are working on, you know, and thinking about. But sometimes, you know, you don't really have a choice as far as which E3 ligase you get to use because one might work and a lot of others might not due to the way the ternary complex forms or things like that. So it's a bit of a guessing game at the beginning, but I think if you can, you know, bias your choices towards those that might be um, expressed differentially, whether it's, you know, within the compart you know, compartment within the cell or within a tissue type, um, you know, that could ha definitely have some added advantages and people in the field are definitely thinking about that. Awesome, thanks. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, again. Our, you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Serena Sanuli, who is joining us from uh, Palo Alto. Yeah, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Uh, you know, probably everything will be smooth. All right. Um, Looks great. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Danita and Gita, for putting together this beautiful symposium. I really enjoy learning about all the different flavors of chromatin biology, and thank you for having me. Um, so I'm a new assistant professor. I opened my lab in January this year in the Department of Genetics at Stanford. And uh, in the lab, we are interested in chromatin dynamics across scales. So today I'm gonna to tell you mainly about the work that I did as a <clears throat> postdoc when I was at UCSF in the lab of John Gross and Gitan Arlikars. And then I'm telling you a little bit more what are the questions we are really interested uh, right now in my lab and what are the projects that are taking, uh, taking place right now that are take, um, picking up in the lab. Um, so the question that we are really interested in is how is the genome structurally and functionally organized in the nucleus of the cell? What you see here is a beautiful image that shows this is the old nucleus, the limited bimembrane. 
we can appreciate immediately that the nucleus environment, nuclear environment is very complex environment with many different compartments. For example, you can see here the nucleolus, you can see here the cahal body, the nuclear speckles. So there are many compartments that are not defined, um, delimited by membranes. And those compartments have very specific compositions and very specific uh, function. So the question that we have is how is the chromatin, the genome structurally organized uh, inside this uh, complex environment? And we know that chromatin can have different architecture, different structure. We are all used to see this image that is an electron microscopy image of a nucleus of a cell. And we can see these dark patches of chromatin and the light patches of chromatin that correspond to two different major types of chromatin. The euchromatin is the open and more relaxed type of chromatin associated with active description, and the heterochromatin, which is more dense and compact, associated with gene silencing. So when I started to think about chromatin architecture, I immediately realized that we had a fairly good high, uh, good understanding or high uh, resolution information, atomic details of the nucleosome shown here, which is the building block, the fundamental unit of chromatin. And we heard a lot of talk yesterday uh, about nucleosome in association with different chromatin factors. And we really know a lot with high resolution about nucleosome in all its glory. Uh, but what I realized is that we, what we know very less is how chromatin fiber, a chain of nucleosome, is organized in 3D and space to form very different chromatin architectures. And so the question is, what are the differences at the structural architectural level between an open chromatin state or a closed chromatin state? And we know this is a really fundamental question in biology because those different chromatin architecture uh, ultimately dictate and regulate the function of the underlying genome. So when I, uh, I did my postdoc and currently even now in my lab, we use as a model system, the HP1 type of heterochromatin. And this is a highly conserved type of chromatin. It's present in yeast and human, and it's essential for a variety of functions, including uh, gene repression, but also genome stability and nuclear rigidity. And so if you look at the uh, HP1 into the cells, and you can see this is the first immunofluorescence from the lab that was done from, by Xi, we can see that HP1 form really bright uh, defined plankton. And so the question is what are the mechanisms that underlie the formation of this plankton and how are these regulated? Uh, we know that HP1 proteins are really good at compacting the DNA. And this was, is a DNA curtains experiment was performed a couple of years ago in the Narlinger lab. And you see here, what you see here is a fluorescently labeled DNA. And then when HP1 proteins are added, they really efficiently compact the DNA towards the top of this slide. So, and I want to point out that HP1 proteins are structural proteins. We heard a lot about enzyme yesterday that our modeling enzyme that uses ATP to push nucleosome and slide nucleosome along the DNA, but HP1 proteins are structural proteins. They don't use ATP, they just bind to the DNA. So how is this compaction happening? What's going on at the molecular and the mechanistic level? Uh, so a lot of labs, some of them are listed here, are really helped to understand at the biochemical level how these proteins interact with chromatin. And we know that HP1 shown here in green, not only can bind chromatin, but have the ability to form oligomerous chain. And this oligomerization ability is essential for gene silencing. So it has been proposed that the oligomerization by HP1 could be important to mediate bridging across nucleosome and therefore drive uh, the compaction of chromatin. Then more recently, what it has been discovered is that HP1 can undergo a process which is called phase separation and give rise to the formation of these liquid droplets that now are called biomolecular condensate. So under specific uh, conditions, HP1 can go from one phase to two phases. And in this dense phase, HP1 is highly concentrated. And you can see in this video here, this is a video showing HP1, human HP1 protein alone in a test tube that forms these highly dynamic droplets that they move around, they fuse. Um, so, and in vivo, if you actually look at um, HP1, this is GFP tag HP1 in cells, you can see that this puncta that I showed you at the beginning are actually very dynamic. And if you follow the arrow here, you can see that over time, um, a cluster of foci will merge together, together, forming a larger foci. So when the phase separation was discovered in the context of HP1, raised a lot of, a lot of excitement. 
And one model is that the phase separation of HP1 could contribute to chromatin uh, organization and specifically to compact chromatin in this phase separated condensate. But actually whether and how chromatin is compacted inside this, uh, this HP1 droplet was still uh, an open question. And I wanna spend a minute also to uh, highlight that we, we are starting to learn more and know more about phase separation. And we know that the formation of these mesoscale droplets are driven, uh, is driven by a network of weak and multivalent interactions. So what does this mean? So multivalent means that each single molecule within a condensate can actually establish multiple interaction with different molecules. And we know that the interactions that are involved are actually very weak and transient. And we know that this transient weakness is essential to, the, to provide the liquid-like properties to this condensate. Um, so this, this phenomenon, this phase separation has raised a lot of challenges for the field because most of the canonical uh, assays are not able to pick up those, to, to measure those dynamic processes or interfere with these processes. So the field is still struggling, but evolving. So this is actually an exciting time for the field to come up with more um, new, new ways to interrogate the system, knowing about the weak and multivalent property of this condensate. Okay, so when I started to think about uh, HP1 phase separation and understanding chromatin compaction, one aspect I thought was essential to really understand how chromatin was compacted was really understanding how HP1 protein are interacting with the chromatin and with the nucleosome. And so my goal was really try to understand how this uh, complex HP1 nucleosome that you see here in this cartoon is structurally organized. And uh, many labs have tried to achieve, to obtain high resolution structure of this complex, but uh, we don't still do today, we don't really have any of those high resolution informations. And the reason is that this complex is extremely dynamic. And so coming in and trying to understand the structure of this complex from a very naive perspective, because my background was in cell biology, I thought that maybe if the, if dyna if the complex is so dynamic, maybe dynamics are actually important for the function of this complex. So I started to look for method that would help me, would enable me to study this complex in solution and really learn about the motions and the dynamics of, of the system. And so what I use, and these are methods that are, we're really still using now in my lab is NMR, cross-linking mass spec, and hydrogen deuterium exchange coupled to mass spec or HDXMS. So, Today, I'm going to tell you just about the HDX MS experiment. And so, what, what I did was to incubate a nucleosome alone or in complex with HP1 in a solution that contains deuterium. So, over time, the hydrogen of the backbone of the protein can exchange with the deuterium in solution, and we can monitor this deuterium uptake by mass spectroscopy. So basically, you would expect that regions that are on the surface of the nucleosome will exchange faster than regions that are buried inside the core. And you can think of this deuterium uptake as a way to measure, to map the accessibility of the complex to the solvent. So when I performed the experiment, I was searching, I was looking for regions in the nucleosome that were becoming more protected. And so with less deuterium uptake, uptake because one, HP1 is binding uh, the nucleosome, and two, because we know that HP1 proteins compact chromatin and make nucleosomes overall less accessible. So I was really surprised when I, when I realized that they couldn't detect any level of protection across the old nucleosome, but only regions that became more exposed to the solvent. And what you see here colored in blue in the nucleosome structure are all the regions of the histones that became more exposed uh, to the solvent when HP1 is bound. And you can't really appreciate well here, but a lot of these regions are really regions, uh, hydrophobic regions buried inside the folded core of the nucleosome. And so this means that HP1 binds the nucleosome and induces a conformational change that reshapes and opens up the nucleosome core. So this was exciting. Uh, first, because it was really an evidence that the nucleosome core is not a rigid unit. And a lot of many other works, some of them have listed, they have recently really shown that not only the, uh, flex, the tails of the nucleosome of the histone that protrude out from the nucleosome core are flexible, but also the folded core can undergo some structural flexibility. And of course, this is, of course, the exciting question now is why and what is the function? 
And specifically, I started to look at, uh, in the context of chromatin compaction, using an assay that was used in the field to monitor chromatin fiber self-association. And in this assay, we can take a chromatin fibers uh, that is soluble and we can measure solubility by simply reading the absorbance at 260. And if you add a protein that uh, promote chromatin fiber self-association, uh, larger chromatin assemblies will form and then will tend to sediment at the bottom of the tube because they are heavier. And so that's exactly what we see when we start adding increasing concentration of HP1 shown here in the X axis, the amount of chromatin that remains soluble decreases. So HP1 is promoting chromatin fiber self-association. What I also did was to take this um, HP1 chromatin assembly and simply look under the microscope. And then I observed the formation, the presence of this phase separated liquid droplet. And if you label chromatin, here we have fluorescently labeled chromatin. We can also see that chromatin is really highly enriched and concentrated inside this droplet. So this was really exciting because there were the, for the first evidence that compaction of chromatin is actually coupled to its phase separation. Um, now, what is the role of this nucleosome conformational dynamic in this process? And so to, to further understand uh, nucleosome conformational dynamics, I, I decided to create a chromatin fiber in which the nucleosome core was locked by inserting cysteine and inducing a uh, disulfide bond at the interface of two histones. So I created basically a chromatin fiber that was more locked and unable to undergo conformational changes. And now we see a defect in pelleting of chromatin as well as defects in um, formation of the space separated droplets. So this indicated that the conformational change within the nucleosome is actually important to compact chromatin into the space separated assemblies. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of the VIVA experiment, but I show you at the beginning that the HP1 can form this uh, bright foci in the cells. And if we start to introduce mutations in HP1 that either abrogate phase separation of the test tube or that interfere with the phase separation process, we do see corresponding changes in the cells where the foci becomes less bright and less in numbers. And we also start to see the fact in gene silencing. And so this is just to highlight that the biophysical properties that we are able to measure in the test tube are really helping us to understand better, better how heterochromatin uh, function in cells. Okay, so to summarize what we have learned now, we have learned that HP1 protein not only bind nucleosome and can uh, oligomerize and bridge across nucleosome, but they can also induce a conformational change in the folded globular core of nucleosome. And this conformational change is essential to drive compaction of chromatin within a phase separated assemblies. And so what we propose is that by opening up the nucleosome core, the hydrophobic region that become exposed are now available on the surface to template nucleosome nucleosome interactions. And these interactions, uh, weak and transient, are the kind of interaction that ultimately can fold a chromatin fiber within a condensate. So, but what I think is even more interesting is try to take this, uh, what we've learned in the context of HP1 heterochromatin and apply that in the context of chromatin organization more broadly. And what you see here is a model that we propose, what we call a liquid-like model, that kind of revised some of the previous models and introduces two, two new concepts. We're gonna tell you about these new, two new concepts because we're really excited about this and those are the, the question that we are really uh, exploring exploring and uh, starting to study now in my lab. So of course, what you see here is the presence of this uh, liquid droplets. And so in this model, we start to think about phase separation as a possible principle that can contribute to chromatin uh, mesoscale functional organization. And while a lot still need to be done to really understand uh, whether and how phase separation regulate uh, the genome and the um, the, the genome expression, gene expression, it just really provides a, a new way to start to think about chromatin organization through structure that are less dynamic, less order, and less defined than previously thought. So we can start to think about chromatin now has a fluid polymer organized through structure that are more dynamic uh, and, and, more, uh, and more transient. 
Uh, and of course, in the lab, the question that we're really interested and in, we're working right now is trying to understand first, what is the molecular composition of the nuclear of these nuclear assemblies? Uh, and how is this composition changing across different cell types? And what, how this composition is correlated or is, reg is regulating the function of these nuclear assemblies? We're also interested in understanding what are the molecular interaction involved in between the molecule that are key component inside this condensate. Can we, and we are starting to really dissect what are the, uh, the mo molecular mechanisms involved in this process. And finally, we are interested in looking at the regulator, um, regulators of these nuclear assemblies. And we are doing that by combining uh, both biochemical, biophysical tool, but also in vivo and genetic tools. I'm gonna just give you a little teaser of the first project that is actually going on right now in the lab. This was a project that was led by Raylin and Akshi. And what they did was to develop a, a genome-wide CRISPR-Cas9 screen to look for HP1 regulators. And uh, what you see here on the right are some of the hits that we were able to obtain. And we're now currently following up on some of those, those hits and really understand how much they regulate HP1 function and, and compartments. Okay, going back to the model, the second aspect that we're particularly interested in is uh, really trying to understand further this nucleosome conformational uh, change, this nucleosome structural flexibility. And what we think is that this distorted or alternative mucosome state might actually be important to regulate chromatin processes. And we can start to think about this mucosome structure flexibility as an extra layer of chromatin regulation. And so in the lab, we have uh, a series of different projects that are tried, starting to tackle this question. But what we're really thinking, we're starting to think of mucosome uh, as a receptor. And you can think that those different conformations within nucleosome, like in receptor, can trigger different signaling in the cells and ultimately regulate uh, the genome function. And so you can really start to think about all oh, how this, this different signaling or nucleosome conformation trigger signaling can uh, regulate many processes in chromatin biology. Uh, one question that we are really interested in is really looking for chromatin factors and better understand how chromatin factors that are interacting with nucleosome can sense or modulate these nucleosome conformations. Uh, I've told you today about the HP1 protein, but it's likely that many other chromatin factors can actually um, modulate nucleosome dynamics when they interact with the nucleosome. We are interested in looking at some of the mutation that might affect nucleosome dynamics as well as intrinsic changes on the nucleosome composition. For example, started to think about histone variants and how they can modulate chromatin di nucleosome dynamics. And so there is a poster today, a flash talk from Ali, um, uh, a student in the lab, and she uh, was a fearless student coming with, from a development biology background that got interested in the question of the H2EE histone variants. And you can, uh, I encourage you to listen to her talk because she's really trying to understand at the mechanistic and biophysical level, how little changes in amino acid sequence that cannot give rise to major structural differences uh, can actually be, be so important for developmental function. Okay, uh, and I'm gonna hand here. Uh, this is uh, our group right now. We are a group of chromatin enthusiasts and I've been really, uh, uh, lucky to get to uh, meet these people and have these people helping me building the lab. We are open to grow our team soon. So if you're in a chromatin enthusiast and you're interested about chromatin, everything about dynamics, please get in touch. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Serena. Wonderful talk. Um, do we have questions? Sarah, Sarah Faulkner. Hi, thank you. That was a really exciting talk. Um, I mm -hmm. have, so for your further um, looking at the phase separation of HP1 alpha, um, H1, linker histone H1 is known to mediate some interactions between HP1 and the nucleosome. Are you going to start looking at that um, in your phase separation assemblies? So this is a great question. Actually, some work has already been done in the context of H H1 and mm -hmm. phase separation. 
And it has been shown, I believe, at least from the Rosen lab, that uh, mm, yeah. the, the addition of H1 um, linker histones actually promote chromatin compaction. So in general, I think uh, every system that people have looked so far that um, increase or made chromatin compaction, we do see increases in promotion of phase separation. Uh, so definitely the linker histone is one of the suspects that was in, in the game. And we know it promotes chromatin compaction, and we know it also promotes uh, phase separation. But it's also interesting to know that from the data that are out there right now, looking at how the linker histone influences nucleosome conformational dynamics, uh, NMR data with the linker histone does not show any major dynamics occurring within the nucleosome mm -hmm. core. So it's interesting because it seems that the, the way in which linker histones of transcription factor interacting with nuclear might promote phase separation could be multiple. Thanks. Um, next question is coming from Greg Bowman. Um, he says, great talk in the HDX experiments. Uh, was the exposure by HP1 related to disruption of histone DNA interactions? Specifically, did histones without DNA have increased deuterium exchange? That is free histone dimer octamers versus nucleosomes. Yeah, this is a great question. So um, I'm going to try to explain. So one thing is that the ex all the experiments that I've done, I've done HDX, cross-linking mass spec, and NMR, all of these data uh, are basically looking at the protein part. So we're not looking, we haven't looked at the, at the DNA part. Um, that say some of the regions that show major the protection within the histones are the regions that are at the interface with the nucleosomal DNA. So I think there is some changes in the DNA um, breathing uh, that also is going on, and likely those changes are coupled with rearrangements in the histone uh, themselves. Uh, that said, it, both NMR experiment and HD experiment were done on condition where the nucleosomes remain intact. And so even if we do see these major rearrangements and dynamics, nucleosomes remain intact. There's no dimer coming off or, or, or you know, a DNA coming off, so it remains intact. Um, we haven't done experiments, HDX experiment, in the context of a dimer and nucle or, or nucleosome, and those are actually interesting questions. There are some technical challenges that has to do with the experiment that uh, we perform were done under physi physiological conditions, which means around 150 millimolar salt. Uh, and if you want to maintain a dimer or an octamer, you need to go much higher in salt, one, two molar salt. And so there are some technical challenges that also raise the question is if we observe something, how much relevant is uh, from the physiological and biological point of view. But it will be interesting to see how much those dynamics actually are, are, are coupled to the DNA breathing health cells. Yeah. I hope I answered the question. Thank you, Serena, for, for an outstanding talk. Um, at this point, I'm going to switch of my uh, moderator hat and put on the presenter one. And uh, I'll tell you a bit about uh, work in, in my lab. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, Greg says, yes, thanks. Serena, thank you for, for answering the question. I just wanted to make sure that uh, um, um, I captured all the questions. Um, so uh, what I'd like to tell you about today is, is, is a bit of the, uh, of of the recent work from our lab on understanding one of the chromatin reader domains that we have a keen interest in. Uh, my lab is interested in post-translational and post-transcriptional uh, regulation of macromolecular function. And uh, one of the systems that uh, is uh, particularly interesting to us is uh, uh, that of uh, chromatin given the uh, beautiful plethora of modifications that decorate uh, uh, histone proteins. So uh, we are interested in function and regulation of chromatin modifications and particularly regulatory mechanisms that couple chromatin recognition with catalytic uh, functions of, of chromatin modifying enzymes. So here is an early example from a terrific uh, postgraduate student at the Liz Ortiz Torres on um, deciphering uh, allosteric communication in, in uh, uh, dimethylase KDM5A. We're also developing chemical probes for uh, epigenetic proteins, uh, exemplified uh, here by a catalytic domain ligand for KDM4 family. And Recently, uh, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we became interested in, uh, 
chromatin mimics harbored within uh, viral genomes since the uh, uh, genome of the coronavirus, specifically in each envelope protein, encodes a close mimic of, of histone 3 that associates with, with uh, bromodomains. So we've heard already today uh, uh, beautiful uh, talks explaining um, uh, histone demethylase uh, class of epigenetic erasers and the uh, KDM5 uh, family. Um, and the uh, uh, enzyme that I'll be uh, talking about today is a member of this family. It's demethylase uh, KDM5A, uh, which is a complex multi-domain protein that is ever expressed in a number of cancers. The catalytic domain removes H3K4 trimethylation. Um, uh, and uh, 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 in addition to, to um, function of the entire protein as the oncoprotein when overexpressed, KDM5A uh, also participates in translocation, uh, fusion of the PhD3 domain in this protein with a nucleoporin component, NUP98, which, which uh, Tanya beautifully mentioned in the context of several fusions yesterday, is a driver of, of AML. We became interested in, in understanding um, uh, regulation of catalysis in this uh, unique um, family of demethylases. Um, as well as uh, ways to target um, uh, aberrant function of, of KDM5. Thus far, most of the small molecule inhibitors, as we've seen in, in Akanes and, and Ginstock, target the catalytic domain uh, and are typically competitive with alpha ketoglutarate, which renders them uh, less, less efficient in cells. And of course, uh, um, these molecules are uh, binding outside of the nucleoporin uh, PhD3 fusion. So uh, we've already heard a bit about uh, Jumanji demethylase catalysis. These are iron and alpha ketoglutarate dependent proteins that utilize molecular oxygen to catalyze uh, oxidative demethylation of, of methyl groups in lysines. KDM5 family is unique in insertion of two regulatory domains, added in PhD1 within the uh, catalytic domain where uh, JMJN and JMJC are, are, are split by uh, this insertion. Uh, while alpha ketoglutarate is required for function and it's an obligatory cost substrate required for every cycle of catalysis, these enzymes are also inhibited by small molecule dicarboxylates. But uh, uh, those are uh, uh, molecules coming from the TCA cycle, uh, such as succinate and fumarate, or the oncometabolite 2 hydroxyglutarate incorporation of, of uh, uh, dicarboxylate regulation provides a, a, an opportunity for, for metabolic regulation of um, uh, demethylases in general. In addition to the catalytic domain, uh, this family harbors three of so-called plant homeodomain reader protein domains or PhD domains. Um, shown here as PhD1, PhD2, and PhD3. Now you will see in a, a flash talk of a, a graduate student, Fatima Ur, who will be one of the presenters in, in, a, 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 in the next group of talks, that not all of the KDM5 enzymes are created equal and that some of them uh, have different organization of the reader's domains and very, very different function as you'll uh, beautifully see in, in the work that uh, um, Fatima will, will present. PhD domains, which Tanya introduced yesterday are readers. They associate with chromatin as a function of the site and the extent of uh, lysine modification. And different molecular interactions account for different uh, ligand preferences. For example, electrostatic interaction in between the carboxylate residue and unmodified lysine in BHC80 accounts for recognition of uh, uh, unmodified lysine by this reader, while aromatic cage residue is similar to those that uh, uh, Lindsay has shown for PWWP domains, accounts for recognition of, uh, of trimethylated lysines by PhD domains such as BPTF. Um, we have been interested in the regulation of catalysis in uh, these enzymes and uh, uh, um, in the work that I will just summarize in bullet points, uh, what we found over the years is that um, demethylases through their PhD1 domain can, uh, or KDM5 demethylase through its PhD1 domain recognizes product of demethylation catalysis. 
while the catalytic domain removes the H3K4 trimethylation, the product of demethylation binds the PhD1 domain and allosterically stimulates a, a catalytic reaction. Uh, uh, first described by in Edelise's work and later beautifully uh, 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 characterized through a series of biophysical and biochemical studies, including um, uh, rigorous uh, uh, kinetic analysis, uh, HDX and cross-linking mass spec. James Longbottom, uh, current postdoc in the lab, has uh, uh, characterized the uh, um, uh, mechanistic basis for the allosteric uh, communication. This stimulation of demethylation through product, product recognition enables positive feedback regulation. And of course, an opportunity to regulate H3K4 trimethylation status, uh, both through uh, chromatin recognition by the catalytic domain, but also through chromatin recognition by the PhD domain. Uh, the unique allosteric function of PhD1 that is seen in this protein is uh, also an appealing opportunity for the development of small molecule inhibitors, uh, which is a, a project led by a talented uh, postdoctoral scholar, Gloria Ortiz. What I'd like to tell you about today is, uh, is a work uh, 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 carried out by James on understanding structure of PhD1 histone 3 complex. And what we are looking at here is a binding of a histone 3 TL peptide to the PhD1 domain in, in, uh, shown in pink, which uh, revealed the alpha helical uh, conformation of the histone 3 when engaged to a PhD1. So just to broadly orient you, two things are shown uh, in, in gray, histone peptide is in orange and the receptor PhD1 is in, is in pink. Um, uh, James used protein and Amara technique that uh, uh, we learned from Mark Kelly, a terrific NMR uh, spectroscopist who runs our uh, NMR facility at UCSF to um, analyze this system. And uh, he made several uh, very important observations that I'll walk you through. PhD domains have very little secondary structure. They, these are uh, uh, very small uh, domains that are eight, eight to 10 kilodaltons large that have a, a beta sheet and, and few helical regions um, uh, uh, within the protein. Upon binding of the histone, there is an additional uh, secondary structure element formed in the end terminus uh, of the PhD1 that um, helps accommodate the ligand, as I will um, uh, show you later. The histone binding surface of the PhD1 is largely negatively charged, as uh, uh, we typically see in uh, uh, histone interacting uh, domains and the uh, and terminus of the peptide tucks in into the, the, the groove of, of the, on the PhD1 surface uh, uh, to uh, display the ligand, which interestingly in its central segment here forms an um, alpha helical structure uh, or rather helical structure. So uh, the helix is held together through uh, intermolecular hydrogen bonds uh, of the H3 peptide itself. And uh, um, among these, um, we observe several uh, very important interac interactions, not only in between the backbone carbonyls and amides as shown by this um, um, A7 to, uh, to K4 interaction, for example, but also critical um, um, hydrogen bonding interactions in between hydroxyl moieties of threonines both in uh, positions T3 and T6 and the backbone amides. So that forms the H3 helix, which is then held to the PhD1 receptor through another set of hydrogen bonding interactions, mostly across the, uh, one of the beta strains of the protein. Um, molecular details of the interaction largely focus the recognition on the uh, critical elements that um, uh, are typical of the PhD1 ligand uh, or PhD domain uh, interactions with the end terminus of histone 3. For example, we see hydrogen bonds in between the end terminal amine and the two backbone carbonyls. We know that this position it does not tolerate any modifications on the end terminus and in fact, James used the scintillation of the end terminus as one of his mechanistic probes in dissecting 
um, um, uh, catalytic crosstalk. There is a, also a, a hydrophobic interaction be, between uh, um, uh, 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 tryptophan that is uh, typically conserved in PhD domains and the A1 residue, and then key electrostatic interactions in between arginine 2, V2 conserved carboxylates, one of which is uh, uh, required for binding. K4 is accommodated in, uh, 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 in a way where hydrogen bonds are being formed in between uh, unmodified lysine 4 of the ligand and uh, carbonyls in the um, uh, PhD1 domain. And there are three hydrogen bonds that, um, that participate in this uh, uh, binding of the lysine. There is also an electrostatic interaction uh, in between glutamate 305 and the ammonium group of the lysine 4. What was an unexpected given the, the previous work on KDN5B's PhD1 domain is uh, uh, engagement of uh, um, uh, aspartate 292 in a hydrogen bonding interaction with uh, arginine 8. So it is this interaction that turns the helix and holds the, the uh, R8 position of the ligand bound to the PhD1 uh, simultaneously with the engagement of, of K4. Um, allowing for this really nice uh, helical orientation of the, uh, of the um, H3 ligand when bound to, to the PhD1. I should also point out that this is uh, one of uh, uh, several instances of helical binding of the H3 ligand to the PhD domains. Uh, additional examples are uh, those of uh, BAS2A and uh, UHRF1, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, work on, on uh, other PhD domains, some, some of which are uh, 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 done by the Kutatology lab, MOS and MORPH and, uh, and, and a few other proteins. So uh, our work adds to um, understanding of elements that, that are now required, that we can now uh, um, analyze across the spectrum of the PhD domains to better understand this alpha helical orientation of the ligand. One of the key determinants is a conservation of, of a carboxylate residues towards the bottom of the helix, uh, which uh, uh, provides electrostatic interactions for the stabil stabilization of the helix. Another interesting feature of the PhD1 domain uh, that, uh, that differs uh, or, or differentiates this domain from a number of chromatin reader is its tolerance towards methylation states. Typically, uh, um, these domains discriminate um, um, uh, methylation states of uh, lysines and are uh, far more uh, specific for uh, one to two uh, methylation states. What we see here is the ability of the PhD1 to uh, bind lysine, not only in its methyl zero unmodified state, but to also to engage, albeit with lower affinities, a monomethylated, dimethylated, and trimethylated lysine. Of course, as the extent of methylation is increased, we see a decreased affinity um, for the binding of the ligand. And uh, um, we also see uh, 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 many more of the residues in the fast, fast um, exchange regime when the weaker uh, K4 uh, trimethylated ligand is bound. By analyzing chemical shift perturbations, James was able to um, understand um, molecular basis for the preference of the lower methylation state that distills down to the exclusion of the higher methylation uh, um, states of lysine due to steric clashing with a short helical segment of the PhD1, which uh, in the case of trimethylated lysine is pushed to the left and, and uh, uh, revealing chemical shift perturbations in a zinc uh, one region of the zinc finger domain as a result of um, swinging out of the, of the PhD1's helix um, to accommodate larger trimethylated ligand. So uh, the work on, on understanding the structural basis of uh, recognition of histone 3 has also given us an opportunity to ask how mutations in this domain, which have been associated with cancer, uh, function to uh, 
to uh, modulate the ability of the domain to engage is its uh, histone ligand. So uh, here is a, a, a short table of several of the mutations that uh, um, occur in the histone binding pocket of the PhD1, which uh, we've been able to um, uh, produce biochemically and measure the affinities for, for uh, various histone tail peptides. What we see across the board is that the mutants um, uh, show decreased affinity for the H3 ligand. And that uh, this varies from uh, mutant to mutant, depending on, on the uh, residues of the histone tail that they are in proximity with. For example, a bladder cancer mutation that mutagenesis is this uh, 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 tyrosine, and, uh, tyrosine and replaces it with, with phenylalanine. So it's a uh, relatively small uh, modification that of course removes a hydrogen bond uh, from the receptor, uh, shows relatively modest two and a half fold uh, decrease in affinity. We hypothesize that this is due to the disruption of the R2 binding site because of the engagement of this tyrosine in a hydrogen bonding network that holds one of the conserved uh, aspartates required for binding of RJ into in place. Uh, mutations in a K4 region of the uh, uh, protein have more profound um, impact on binding. So, uh, one of those is a mutation of E305 to K, changing the uh, charge of the residue, which would induce an electrostatic clash in between the uh, PhD1 and its K4 ligand, which has the most profound uh, impact on, on the ability of the PhD1 to, to engage the ligand. Uh, we also see um, loss in affinity in uh, stomach adenocarcinoma and CNS glioma associated mutation D292-2N, which um, uh, disrupts the ability of arginine 8 to uh, form the uh, helix of, of histone 3 when uh, interacting with, with PhD1. So in summary, um, what we've learned through this work is that PhD domains uh, in our, one of our favorite proteins, KDM5A, engage um, histones uh, differently. Not, and this difference not only comes from the preference for methylation state, but also from the secondary structure adopted by the ligand. So to the right is the structure from uh, Patel Analysis Lab uh, um, uh, that shows binding of the trimethylated lysine 4 to the PhD3 recruitment domain of, of the KDM5A, which shows the ligand in a, a beta sheet um, uh, orientation. What we see with the uh, PhD1 is a preference um, to unmethylated lysine 4, although with the tolerance for other methylation state and binding of the ligand in a, in a helical uh, conformation highlighting diversity of, of reader domains in their ability to uh, 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 adopt um, uh, to uh, ligands in different secondary structures in addition to different modification states. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank my lab. I uh, already pointed out to, to uh, James's critical contributions to uh, the work that I've presented today. Uh, the past work on, on mechanism in addition to James was uh, carried out by Idelise and, and uh, Cynthia, uh, our uh, many collaborators, and in particular, Mark Kelly for uh, uh, all the NMR that we've learned from him. And thank you all for uh, your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Hey, Denise, nice talk. Um, I wanted to, you're probably familiar with these so-called oncohistone mutants. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I believe there is a, K, a K4 uh, methionine um, mu mutation. I, it's not one of the most common ones. Uh, you, that is K27, but it is the- No, the, the, the most famous one is 27, but I, I think they've now uncovered, you know, there was like this flurry of them that were, that David Alice and others- Oh, I should it. check. Thank you for pointing um, to that. I should check on. Uh, uh, and this, and yeah. in, in, in that light, do you know if you replace that lysine with methionine, if it would still bind to PhD1? 
You know, that's a, a wonderful question. We have been uh, quite interested in uh, understanding substrate tolerance uh, or ligand tolerance for the, for the PhD domains. And uh, um, recently with uh, Milan Merkschiff's lab at Northwestern, we, we have uh, very systematically analyzed um, how perturbations of the uh, 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 ligand impact their ability to bind to a PhD one. But we have always kept the lysine invariant. So, okay. so from that data set, uh, we, we, we just have not changed it and uh, um, we have not measured the, the methion and ligand. Well, thank you for uh, that question, Phil. Without further ado, we have saved uh, uh, what we think is uh, uh, potentially the, or, or the best of this symposium, the, the next generation for our flash talks. Uh, so we will... Alexa, there's one question for you. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even see it. Do you want me to read it out? Okay, and uh, I can read it. Any oh, cancer great, great. is coming from uh, high, thank you, Gita, uh, from high Dao, any cancer associated mutations in PhD1 that favor the interaction with uh, K4 methyl 1, 2, 3 over K4 methyl 0. So that's a fantastic question. And uh, uh, James has uh, done. Uh, really nice work in, un in understanding tolerance of different methylation states for um, all of the cancer mutants that I've described. That uh, 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 work is, uh, the numbers are uh, uh, available in our recent ACS uh, chem bio publication. So rather than me trying to recall exact preferences, I would, uh, I would direct you for, uh, to that. But what we see is um, exactly what you are asking. Uh, difference in uh, preferences that change with the mutation, and not only uh, uh, in full preferences, and not only difference in um, um, affinities for individual uh, methylation state. Great question. So uh, we will now move on to uh, our flash talks and we'll start with uh, Sarah Faulkner who is in Yale David's lab and she is joining us from New York. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'll just... So for these talks, we have five minutes and two minutes for Q&A and we'll be limiting questions to perhaps one. Okay, um, everyone can see my slides okay? Um, great, okay. So, um, well, thank you. And I'm here today to um, talk about a manuscript that we have just recently submitted describing a novel function for the linker histone H1. So, um, H1 has been known for a long time and it has a fairly well described function in chromatin compaction. And this is where H1 pulls adjacent nucleosomes closer. And the H1 to nucleosome stoichiometry is known to determine how compact the chromatin is, um, helping to establish and maintain regions of heterochromatin in the cell. And we know that H1 recognizes the diode axis of the nucleosome via its ordered globular domain, and then compacts the, um, the chromatin via its um, disordered C-terminal domain. And work on, the, um, on H1 and the David lab really began with Waller, who was an amazing PhD student who did a lot of work to express and characterize most of the 11 H1 variants biochemically. And we've focused on variant H1.4, which is not the strongest um, binder, but is the strongest compactor. Um, so we were set out to do this experiment in collaboration with Xuxian Liu's lab in Rockefeller, um, where we can study, do single molecule optical tweezers studies of um, chromatin arrays. And to do this, the setup basically is we have these um, Streptavidin coated beads immobilized between lasers um, with a strand of DNA immobilized between them. And we're able to move one of the beads further apart and monitor the force it takes to pull them apart to get an idea of the compaction strength. And so we set out to do this with fluorescently labeled H1, both to um, look at its distribution along the chromatin array and also to look at the force of compaction. So we made our fluorescently labeled, Psi3 labeled H1 and began this experiment. So what you see here is a chymograph. And this is, we take a single um, one dimensional slice of the um, fluorescence and then stitch these together along the X axis to get a picture of how the um, 
distribution along the DNA changes over time. So we know that H1 does have some interaction with double-stranded DNA. So we would expect to see what we're seeing here, basically this non-specific interaction um, with the DNA faintly between the two beads. But what we got as we pulled the bead apart was this very surprising interaction. Sorry, to mention, this is just DNA, um, DNA with no nucleosomes whatsoever. This was our negative control. We were not expecting to see this. And what we got was this really surprising pattern. We would get these two bright foci forming as we pulled the DNA further, stretch it further and further apart. And what we realized was happening was that as we were stretching the DNA, eventually we got these tears exposing single-stranded DNA. And the H1 was actually binding to the single-stranded DNA and coalescing, which was a very surprising and new phenomenon to us. So we wanted to see, is this something that happens in cells? And it seems like, yes. So we can see there are these, um, this is live cell imaging with GFP tagged H1 and h 2 b tagged M cherry. And we do see these foci of full length H1, which very interestingly, some of these seem to be anti-correlated to the H2B signal. So the H2B is marking chromatinized DNA. And what we're seeing is H1 that is actually finding where chromatinized DNA isn't. And we can also see that this is dependent on the presence of the disordered C-terminal tail, which has been um, implicated in phase separation of H1 before. So we wanted to see, is this phase separation going on explaining these puncta? So um, Shishin's lab again did some work um, studying droplets of H1 mixed with SSDNA. And we saw some fusion behavior, which was um, characteristic of what we might expect from liquid-liquid phase separation. And again, we wanted to see, is this happening in cells? And when we did, this is again, transfected with um, GFP tagged H1, this time treated with hydroxyurea to induce some uh, replication fork stalling and an ATR kinase inhibitor to increase the amount of SSDNA in the cell. And over, um, over time, sorry. Um, Oh God, sorry, my slides have stopped advancing. Anyway, um, sorry, what we see over time is this formation of these puncta um, that actually appear to fuse and then stay fused, which is again, what we might expect from some liquid-liquid phase separation behavior. So um, finally, we wanted to see, is there a biological function for this behavior? So Gabby and the Leo lab constructed this model of a stored replication fork where there was a junction at one of the ends of the double-stranded DNA. And what she saw was that we do appear to get accumulation of the H1 at the region of single-stranded DNA at the fork junction. Um, and this appears to stabilize the um, single-stranded, or stabilize the um, fork junction. And again, what we see, this is um, uh, AGFP H1 and also co-transfected with um, RFP tagged PCNA, which is present at replication forks. And what we see is that some of these um, H1 foci appear to be co-localizing, kind of coalescing around the um, PCNA foci. And this phenotype becomes more pronounced when we treat with our DNA damaging agents. So this has led us to believe that um, this binding or H1 phase separation around single-stranded DNA may potentially be a mechanism for sequestering and um, grouping single-stranded DNA at stored replication forks. So with that, um, I would like to thank the David Lab and, and Yale David for helping me, uh, allowing me to join the lab. It's been great. And also um, the students who have worked on this paper, particularly um, Walla um, and from our lab and Rachel and Gabby from Shishin's lab. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah, for a great talk. Questions? Uh, Gita. Um, great talk, Sarah. Uh, I have a question. You talked about single standard DNA. Have you tried looking at uh, what happens with RNA? Uh, yes, we have. So um, basically what we see with RNA is we tend to get these even more viscous um, droplets that take a very long time to um, diffuse. We do, um, we haven't specifically looked at it in our um, cellular imaging experiments, but that is an avenue that we would be interested in looking in further, um, particularly with some of the recent work that's come out with um, RNA helping to um, organize the um, nucleus. Thank you, Sarah. Again, our next speaker, also from the Weed Lab, is Nicholas Prescott. Um, okay, we have Nicholas.
You are on, uh, on mute. Thank, there we go. Thank you, sorry. You um, thanks for the invitation to be here today and share some of my uh, thesis research in Yale Beads Lab where I'm looking at the intersection of chromatin biology and virology through uh, hepatitis B virus. So just for a brief background, um, HPV is a relatively unique uh, virus in that it enters the cell as this partially double-stranded circular piece of DNA, which then gets repaired to be a covalently closed circular DNA or CCC DNA, as I'll call it for the rest of my talk. And uh, CCC DNA finally becomes populated with host histones um, to form this stable mini chromosome of just the viral genome. This is the primary template for transcription of viral genes. And importantly, it is uh, the reason why there's no cure for HBV. We have effective vaccinations, but once a cell has become infected, it's impossible to cure because there's no way to eradicate this mini chromosome. Um, Upon transcription of CCC DNA, obviously we have viral infection proceeding, and importantly, HBV only encodes one effector protein in the host genome, the aptly named HBX protein, because for the longest time the field wasn't sure of the actual function of HBX. More recently, it was shown that HBX is involved in the inducing the degradation of the SNC5 and 6 complex, which uh, we canonically know to be involved in genome stability and DNA repair. However, it was also shown that in the absence of HBX, SMC5 and 6 serves to silence uh, transcription from CCC DNA. And so when we think about this it, and take a step back, we sort of have this paradoxical chicken and egg relationship where you need transcription to take place from the CCC DNA, but of course you need HBX present to degrade SMC5 and 6 for transcription to take place. So this has been an outstanding question in the field and we wanted to use some of the chromatin biochemistry uh, techniques in our lab to try and get a better understanding of it. So to do this, I set out to develop a platform to just assemble this recombinant mini chromosome in vitro, much the same as we do um, to make sort of nucleosome arrays with the YNM601 DNA sequence. And really gratifyingly, it assembled um, after some optimization. And we can see here for a linear control, I just have a linear form of a viral genome uh, termed DSL DNA, as well as the CCC DNA. We see this nice gel shift upon histone incorporation. Um, seeing is believing though, so together with the atomic force microscopy facility we have uh, here at Sloan Kettering, I was able to take these really lovely micrographs where you can see individual uh, foci, which are single octomers populating the DNA fiber. And finally, together with Viviana Riska's lab at Rockefeller University, we've also done some MNA sequencing experiments to look at these specific nucleosome positioning across the viral genome. Um, so with this in hand, we were really excited to set out um, and just do some biochemistry and try to understand this paradox. Um, and to do so, I first set out to do in vitro transcription on it. And what I found was very surprisingly, this chromatinization dependent increase in viral gene expression, um, which we believe is not due to simply uh, supercoiling from the histone incorporation, because we also see this increase in the linear uh, control. So we wanted to understand this a little bit better. And um, sort of like Professor Romani was alluding, or alluding to in his talk yesterday, I made arrays with different degrees of octomer saturation throughout them, as you can see here, and I've labeled them undersaturated, intermediate, or fully saturated. And when we quantify them, we see that they all occupy roughly the same volume uh, per uh, mini chromosome, but we see an increase in compaction as you would expect from further histone incorporation um, down here, where we're using volume per surface area ratio as a proxy for compaction. Um, when I looked at individual transcripts from the viral genome, we saw for three of them, there's a relatively moderate but detectable increase in uh, transcript abundance as I added more and more octomer. But for the transcript that encodes HBX, there's this absolute dependence on relatively high degrees of histone saturation for um, the transcript to be transcribed. And so it took us a while to try and reconcile this and build a model, but what we eventually come up with is the idea that Upon chromatin assembly, you get this weak, uh, relatively weak compared to throughout the rest of the genome, a weak minus one and plus one nucleosome that provide the architecture for the transcription machinery to take place and uh, express at least a small catalytic amount of this HBX protein so that it can degrade SMC5 and 6 and allow infection to take place. Opening up the idea that maybe we can um, try to find some new therapeutic vulnerabilities if we can direct chromatin uh, chaperones and remodelers to CCC DNA in the future. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank my wonderful lab, the uh, funding powers that have allowed me to do this research, the organizers for their invitation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Nicholas. Questions?
Uh, we have a question from Ali. Hi, I was just curious if you look at HPV in the actual cell, do you see any like histone variants that are binding preferentially or is it mainly canonical? Um, so that is not something that people have actually looked at very much. I, we're actively working on that right now in the lab, um, but we do have a few candidates that we're really interested in. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. And with that, we'll transition to our next speaker, um, Ali Wilkening, who is joining us from Serena Sanuli's lab at Stanford. Yes, so hi. Um, so my comment about uh, histone or nucleosome, alternative histones and nucleosomes will become apparent in a second. Um, so this is gonna be a slightly different talk than what we've seen. I am just beginning my PhD journey. And as Serena alluded to earlier, I'm coming from more of a developmental biology background. So I'm gonna tell you about a project that has gotten me really excited about structure and how it can relate to um, understanding better uh, developmental functions. I can change it. So everyone knows what the nucleosome is. I don't need to introduce it here, but I'd like to highlight two different parts. And so most people today have been talking about histone tails, their modifications and how that influences chromatin architecture as well as interactions with transacting factors. Um, but Serena and I are interested in looking more at this globular core, which was once thought to be static and inflexible, but Serena and a few other people have shown is not, and it can uh, create these alternative states that actually inform the interactions of chromatin structure and its interactions with transacting factors. So there are a number of kinds of dynamic changes that nucleosomes can undergo, this DNA peeling or breathing, uh, histone disassembly, or even octomer distortion, which is mainly what we're going to be talking about today. So Serena introduced this idea of SWI6 binding and its ability as, non, as a non-enzymatic structural protein to introduce this compaction of DNA. Uh, and it does this by promoting these like ensemble of additional states. So it shifts this equilibrium from a canonical state into these more disordered states, which possibly inter increase these protein-protein interactions. So interactions between the nucleosomes themselves to promote compaction and also phase separation. Um, and so from this work, as well as others, we found that nucleosome core dynamics are biologically relevant. So they're important for these interactions and for compaction and architecture. And so my question is, my naturally occurring nucleosome variants also use nucleosome dynamics to create their specific um, sequence preferences and functional effects. So I'm gonna be talking about two different um, sequence uh, histone variants, H2AZ1 and H2AZ2. And this is work from Joanna Visochka's lab, also at Stanford, showing that they have quantitative differences in their enrichment in promoters and enhancers, respectively. Um, and they also have non-redundant functions. So this is looking at Xenopus head cartilage in the developing uh, tadpole. And so we have the, a knockdown of SRCAP, which deposits H2AZ. And as you can see, it creates this craniofacial defect and it actually mimics a um, congenital defect in humans called floating harbor syndrome, um, which is where your jaw doesn't form properly. And it's due to a loss of migration of neural crest. Uh, so when you add H2AZ2 mRNA, so you're overexpressing this when you're doing the knockdown, you actually get a rescue and you get this full craniofacial phenotype. Um, however, if you try to rescue it with H2AZ1, it's not functional. And what's really interesting about this is that they have these two very different functions that are in this like tissue specific defect, uh, and yet they have almost exactly the same sequence. So I've highlighted here the three amino acids that are different between these two histone variants. Um, and while there are a few other isoforms, these are the ones that are most populous in neural crest. And I've highlighted here, it was meant to animate in, but the only one that creates an actual structural difference is this amino acid difference here at the end of alpha helix one. Um, and as you can see, while there is a slight change, uh, so this alpha helix here is changed from H2A, but the difference between Z1 and Z2 is very minimal. It's almost identical. Um, and so our question is, there's these differences in deposition in this function and these sequence preferences of H2AZ and H2AZ1 and H2AZ2. So might dynamic processes explain their unique functions? Um, and again, just beginning. So this is some very preliminary data. And this is looking at mononucleosomes in vitro binding to SWI6. 
Uh, and we're using that because Serena's previously shown that the ability of SWI6 and nucleosomes to interact is dependent on their uh, core dynamics. And so we're looking at a proxy or a beginning measurement of possible changes to nucleosome dynamics by looking at changes to SWI6 binding. And what's interesting here is that we see a big difference in the KD between the wild type and the H2AZ when they're unmethylated. So this is a canonical nucleosome. This is the normal with H3K9 methylation. And then this is incorporating H2AZ from Xenopus and H2AZ with the methylation as well. Uh, and what's interesting about this finding is that while we see the big difference in these unmethylated versions, when Serena looked at the SWI6 binding between uh, canonical and locked nucleosomes that she mentioned in her talk earlier, she actually found a larger difference in the KD between the methylated locked and unlocked. So it's interesting what's going on here. Again, this is preliminary data, so I'd like to redo it to make sure. But I think that already we're seeing that there could be a difference in the core dynamics when you incorporate H2AZ, which is helping us to understand that this might that this core dynamics might be a way that histone variants can alter nucleosome dynamics to create their specific functions. So I've had a early uh, show uh, some preliminary data showing that they could interact with transacting regulatory factors. Uh, I want to repeat this FP analysis with H2AZ1 and Z2 from humans to identify differences between the variants, do further char structural characterization with HGS, max spec, and NMR that Serena mentioned. Um, and then also, I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but also look at sequence-specific nucleosome dynamics and alternative uh, DNA confirmations and how they could impact it as well. Uh, so with that, I'll just acknowledge my lab and my funding sources. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to talk. Thank you, Ali. Uh, a question from Nicholas. Um, really cool stuff. Have you considered before getting into like HDX and NMR just as like a, maybe an easier first pass trying to use differential scanning fluorimetry or something to see if you can detect changes in the nucleosome core stability just using that um, or if that might be too coarse or you know not high enough resolution? I haven't heard about that before. So what is it called again? Uh, differential scanning fluorimetry or protein thermal shift. Uh, Fisher yeah, says I can look into kit. that. I think I think there might be. I mean, definitely HDRX mass spec would and the NMR would give us a more fine grain, but it would be definitely worth uh, looking into. Um, there's especially some other experiments where I want to go broader, and so that would be a nice way to look at it as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, our uh, next speaker is Fatima Ur. She is a graduate student at uh, UCSF in my lab. Hello. Um, I'm a PhD student in Denise's lab, and today I'll be telling you about my work on a regulation of a histone demethylase and how that is misregulated in intellectual disability. Um, so as Denise has already mentioned, um, we study the KDM5 family in the lab, which demethylates H3K4 trimethyl, which is a mark found as promoters of transcriptionally active genes. And what's really unique about this uh, KDM5 family compared to other families is the number of these unique accessory domains and the fact that two of these domains are uniquely inserted between um, the catalytic domains, um, which really gives rise for a uh, unique regulation of uh, catalysis. And the function of all these domains, some are understood and some are not, um, especially in one family member, KDM5C, uh, um, which I study, uh, has a unique role in regulating neural development. Um, and this is really showcased in the disorder that it's implicated in, which is intellectual disability. Um, there are a number of mutations that are found all throughout KDM5C, especially dispersed in between regions of um, domains, really indicating that the regulation of how these domains come together is important for the function of this enzyme. A number of these mutations have actually shown um, to decrease methylase activity, and how that really is achieved isn't clear because, um, as you can see, they're quite distal to the catalytic domains. So I'm interested in studying um, how KDM5 is regulated and how this regulated uh, regulation is disrupted by these x mutations. And I'll be um, focusing on um, these mutations for this talk. Um, so we're interested in looking at these two mutations that are uniquely found around these um, domains that are inserted between catalytic domains. And we were interested in studying this on the context of the nucleosome as a number of multivalent interactions are expected um, between these um, domains. And what we found was actually something interesting is, is that these X-lead mutants actually bind tighter to the nucleosome 
contrary to what we expected, as we expected high affinity states with multi scale interactions. However, it seems like that's not the case in wild types, and that something about these mutations um, are disrupting the conformation of these um, domains, making them more accessible for recognition of the nucleosome, even though they're in two different um, sites on the enzyme. Um, so this enhanced affinity could be due to enhanced histone tail recognition or DNA recognition. And what we actually find that it's enhanced DNA recognition as KDM5C can actually sense uh, linker DNA. And this gain of affinity um, is seen on this uh, nucleosome in the presence of linker DNA, suggesting that likely the error domain, which is a putative DNA binding domain, its conformation is altered in a way that um, enhances DNA binding. Um, strangely enough, this linker DNA recognition is actually not present in the presence of the substrate modification in the case of wild type. But in the uh, case of these exo mutants, they actually can recognize linker DNA bypassing this regulation constantly, regardless of substrate um, modification, um, really highlighting how they're in this locked state um, with DNA, strong DNA affinity. Um, so what does this have to do for methylation? So we looked at kinetics um, on uh, nucleosome substrates. And surprisingly, we actually see both productive and non-productive states, even though these two mutants um, you know, share this high DNA affinity, um, which is quite puzzling as the C87G mutation is actually more efficient than wild type, but causes intellectual disability. Um, so when we turn to a more relevant substrate, which is substrate in the, um, with linker DNA um, on open chromatin, which is where KDM5C is found, we actually find that the exit mutants are, um, their activity is inhibited by the presence of linker DNA, um, whereas wild type is, is not affected, um, suggesting that because these mutants are better recognized and are strongly binding to DNA, they're now sensitized to the presence of linker DNA and now um, are inhibited, um, which might have consequences in terms of uh, mechanism of disease as um, you know, there's stronger implications at their sites on open chromatin. Um, so overall, we see that wild type, although I, I didn't talk about it much, senses um, has specificity for the substrate modification. The exit uh, mutants that I've studied actually bypass this um, have a locked um, altered conformational state where the error domain is uh, likely always just binding to DNA, um, and this causes non-productive um, demethylation. Um, so we can probably uh, uh, expect that perhaps these exit mutants might be working in a different way than we expected, um, where the KDM5C might be in a more non-productive conformation um, with lower activity um, at sites of open chromatin um, where this enzyme localizes. Uh, and with that, I'd like to take uh, thanks to Nisa in the lab and folks here at UCSF. I'll take questions. Uh, questions for Fatima? Thank you, Fatima, for a great talk. Um, we have reached the, the end of the symposium and I'd like to thank all the speakers for truly giving us a beautiful overview of chromatin from fundamentals to the clinic exactly as we intended by the symposium. Uh, thank you for, for finding time. Thank you for your engagement. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all the attendees. We love the questions. Thanks for, for uh, keeping them coming and uh, uh, thank you to the QBI organizers, especially Gina, Carolina, Alexa and Jacqueline for making this uh, symposium run so smoothly. Um, thanks everyone again. We are hoping to do this in person at some point. Thank you all. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.